on the show until you reach 89 shows. So we made it to 90. So he right. finally decided to join us. So yeah. it, I think it's it's great. It's always it's working out perfectly. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> That's uh, <I'm> 90. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're welcome. I mean, I guess tonight, a uh, guy we've been wanting to have on the show for a while. Uh, I, I interviewed him a couple of years ago when he was at his old company, but Mr. Eddie Guerra of Altidus USA. Eddie, welcome to Primetime. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here as always. Uh, yep. You know, we wanted to come back, back on the show for a while and uh, chat it up. We had a schedule, but, you know, to try to do it in February. But that kind of got a little yeah, that, and that was yeah, there was scheduling more on my end. Unfortunately, it was very difficult. Uh, February was just a crazy month, and uh, <laughs> you know, th sometimes it just happens these types of things. And then I screwed actually for folks that don't know, I actually screwed the day up. I told Eddie the fifth, right? Because I was looking mm -hmm. at the wrong calendar, and I, I pinged Aaron over the weekend as I was doing the promos. I realized I screwed up. I said, "Hope Eddie could do Thursday." <laughs> um, and Eddie was more than kind enough to oblige that, so we do appreciate that. So thank you. No, my pleasure. It's good to be on the show, and especially when it's show ninety. Now, now I can be on the show. That's right. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. No, that's right. It's uh, you know, and 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 you know, I'm excited about tonight's show because you know we're gonna get into it. The, I'll tell this when you look at what's under the portfolio. Uh, it's an, it's, it's, a, I'm sure you're in an exciting place, but let's kind of take a step back. Eddie, you know, the, the first question we traditionally ask on this show, how did you get into cigars? Um, well, I'll give you the cliff notes. That's fine. Um, I was, uh, I was in, uh, hospitality and I was uh, working with a company as their global marketing director, opening up, uh, hotels and beach clubs around the world. And. They ended up relocating me to Thailand. I was uh, out there doing my thing, loving life, living on some island. And um, I wanted to provide some cigars for my, for my guests, really. And called back home, you know, a lot of us here in Miami, we, we grew up, went to the same schools as a bunch of other manufacturers. And I just called a bunch of people on you and said, hey guys, I, I wanna, I want to sell your cigars in my hotel. I just, you know, I, I don't have access to them in Thailand. All I have is Habanos and um, I want to give a little bit of a variety. And, you know, everybody kind of was like, yeah, cool. But, you know, you kind of need to like really buy cigars. Like I just wanted it for a hotel. I was like, yeah, I need two boxes of this, two boxes of that. And they're like, dude, you got You want it in Asia. You got to be an importer. <laughs> so, you know, I had a, hotel association meeting with 90 other hotels and I kind of pitched the idea to everybody. And then like, like overnight I became a distributor in, in Southeast Asia. And then that led into eventually leaving that company and um, opening up a uh, very nice whiskey and cigar lounges in Bangkok. And at one point we had four of them in Bangkok and uh, a nice distribution network and you know, there was a military coup, so that was a little weird for me. Um, I felt like it was probably time to uh, move back home and avoid political turmoil, and I did. And um, I came back. A lot of these guys that I was importing and distributing offered me jo jobs, and, you know, I landed with Gurkha. Um, and then after that, you know, worked really hard and finally made it to the, uh, to the big leagues over here in Altidus. What um what, what kind of cigars were you smoking early on? Like you know, in those early days before you kind of got the Gurkha. Oh man, um, geez, before I even got into the business, I mean, born and raised and grew up around cigars. My parents, my father grew tobacco in Cuba, so it's kind of that whole story happened. But uh, it was Padron, as as everybody else in Miami smokes. Uh, that's kind of what we all grew up on, um, and then. Uh, Puente, again, kind of like the same thing. And then once moved to uh, Tejas and got jumped into business, I was really heavy on Perdomo. And they're a big, they're a big business for us over there. And I did a lot with uh, EPC and uh, PDR. Did a lot with Abe. Sean Williams at the time had his own brand. We did a lot of distribution with him and Oliva, my father, Tatuaje, and then you know the everyday usuals, all the big guys. When you were at Gurkha, um, you know, that's a company that's known 
for their marketing of their products. And you were there for about two years? Yes. Well, two years in, in Miami. Again, I was a, I was a distributor importer, so I, I was working with them closely overseas. Okay. okay. And then they brought you. Yeah, they brought you here. Um, what was, I mean, that was kind of an interesting scenario for to be a marketing guy at a company that I would say really values marketing of their products. Yeah, you know what? It was I had at the time I came back, I had a couple opportunities, and you know. For what I did for a living, you know, working with a lot of liquor brands and working with packaging and, and marketing and design, I really wanted to come in and start my U.S. career with a very strong uh, company that was going to help me grow in, in the luxury lifestyle range. And, um, you know, for good or for bad, for me, it was probably the perfect place to land. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I was able to you know, what was great over there is they, they gave me a lot of free reign to to work with packaging and design. And as you know, that was that was a fun place to do that. So, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, that's what I was saying. It's kind of like exactly. And, and you know, what? I'm, I'm really thankful for that because that kind of led to where I'm at today. And you'll start noticing kind of a difference in packaging change and, and all the upcoming products and that we're releasing this year as well. And that's that's really a carryover from from the experience over there. So that was a good time. I enjoyed it. The team there was great. So no, it, uh, you also, one other thing that you mentioned too, is you, you really seemed to push the pairing piece when you were over there, uh, where, you know, Gurkha became much, so you started pushing Gurkha, not just as a cigar brand, but a brand that could be paired with lifestyle, which I thought was a very good thing you did there. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, you know what? I, I think in general, the whole, the big, big picture of, of what we do in, in tobacco business and cigars, this is still an everyday luxury, man. It's not many people could be sitting here smoking two or three, eight dollars, nine dollars, ten dollars cigars and up daily. And, and to do that, it's really a luxury. And the people that partake in this generally live a certain lifestyle. And I mean, why not? I, I've always found it easier to market a lifestyle and tie a brand together than it is to just market a specific brand. I, I feel you, you build a better connection with with who you're trying to target. You know, if, you, if you could infiltrate their everyday life and say, "Hey, what do you eat? What do you drink?" You know, this cigar goes with all that, and you kind of maneuver your way in there. Yep. So you made a big move early last year. Um, caught a lot of us by surprise. Uh, mm -hmm. You move over to to Altidus USA. Um, Taking on a different role, you weren't you weren't moving into a pure marketing role, but it was more of a brand manager role, correct? It was, um, which you know what uh, it was. A lot of people didn't get it. They're like, "Hey, you went from being the director to now just like the senior brand manager. Like, what's up with that?" You know. And for me, well, two things. When I moved back into the states, and I knew that this was a career path I was gonna go like I had one goal in mind. That's it. So eventually I'm going to work for the biggest brand in the world. Some way, somehow I'm going to be there and some way, somehow I'm going to be able to get my, like, it's, it's an honor and it's a privilege, the history of like Monte Cristo and Romeo Julieta and, and all of our brands. Like this, this comes back from like my family in Cuba. So I'm thinking like to have that opportunity, that's where I eventually want to end up. So I got lucky. Um, Worked hard, but got still got lucky and, and ended up there. But the brand manager role for me was a better way to get more well-rounded in the business. Yeah, prior, a lot of times, just marketing is just marketing. Like, hey, I'm going to design this product. This is who I want to showcase it to. And, you know, hopefully the sales team kind of sees my vision in this role. You know, uh, at Altus, it's a little bit different as a brand manager because they really kind of give you the keys to the car. So you manage a brand, you manage it completely. You're managing P and L's, you know, something I didn't have to do before at Gurkha, obviously. So it was like, you're, you're managing production lines, you you know, shipping times, you, you, you're, you work together with the sales team to make sure you're pushing it all. And you, you travel to all the locations. You really, you really kind of like own the brand per se. So I, for me, it was it was a no brainer. It was in fact, if I really planned on taking this career to the next level, I thought that position was ideal for me and and with the perfect company. So, um, it was a blast. That that first year, you know, 
was a blast. And and now you're going to start seeing all that hard work roll out. And I'm really thankful and grateful and just happy. No, it's it's a great, I mean, we're going to get into it because as I said, when you look at what Altidus has, um, you know, I just spent time with my father a couple weeks ago, who's not really, he's a cigarette guy. He's not really into cigars, but I mean, when he, I mean, he, I know what he smoked for the most part is he, he smoked Monte Cristo and Romeo Julieta and chances are anyone who smoked a cigar has smoked a cigar from your company is really what it comes down to. Whether you're an yeah. experienced or a casual, someone's touched the cigar out of Altidus USA. Yeah, no, nah, absolutely. So it, the brands are, are powerful. The the history of all the brands are powerful. I mean, even our smaller boutique brand, which I mean, we're all smoking tonight, right? Like Henry Clay, which is we'll get into it later. But like the history of that brand is kind of unbelievable as well. So it's almost like I, I got led into this tobacco playground and it's like, all right, man, well, you know, here are the keys to the car. What are you going to do with all this history and how are you going to market it? And it, it was it's fun. You know, challenging, fun. Sure, sure. So, a little about for maybe our audience. Um, you know, Altidus USA. We hear we hear of different um, entities. We hear Altidus USA. We hear Tobacalera USA. We hear Imperial. What's mm -hmm. the relationship between all of those three? So maybe our audience understands that. So we'll start at the top, right? So uh, Imperial Tobacco. It's you know one of the largest uh, tobacco companies in the world out of Bristol. Um, you know, they're into mass market. They own cigarettes. Uh, they own, you know, new generation products like vapes. They own uh, mass market cigars. But they also own a premium business. You know, we're, we're in the premium business. So they own uh, Tabacalera out of Spain and, and Tabacalera USA. So Tabacalera out of Spain, is you know cigar company a little cigar company there but also they're 50 percent of habanos okay uh, so they have that and then tabacalera owns altris usa so in theory you know imperial owns everything so uh tabacalera usa now owns altris jr and then casa monte cristo and we really are all separate companies. We do work together. Obviously, we're under one big family umbrella, but we do operate on our own and we have our own CEOs and um, it's interesting. So, so, so you all to this USA, the brands and then the retail operations, JR and Casa de Monte Cristo. Yeah. And, and those two are separate too, you know, so JR primarily online, you know, with, and then Santa Clara is the uh, distribution and right. then Casa de Monte Cristo third you know pillar which is you know brick and mortar and uh, it's it's really about experiencing the lifestyle of all of our products and everything that we sell and it, it all comes to one under that umbrella so that's that's pretty fun yeah we kind of saw in, in north carolina we saw a transformation the the jr store became a casa de monte cristo store so it moved from like more of that catalogy type of store to more of a, a very premium high end store uh, in Mooresville, where we have. Yeah, and and you know, and and it's still evolving. The, that company's still rather new, but I mean, we're we're up to twenty eight locations nationwide and um, growing. So, and we still manage to keep it, even though it's theoretically owned by our parent company and it has our name on it. I mean, it's theoretically still a very neutral store. You go, you go in there, and they they sell everybody else's product, you know. So it, it's interesting how that business runs. Yeah, it sure it really is. Uh, you know, I walk in there, I'll see like Christian Aroa's product. Uh, you know, I'll see Dion's product. You know, I'll yeah. see Davidoff even. So I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different things I'll see there. Right, because it that's you know more the the lifestyle end of it. Yeah. No. Exactly. Exactly. And, and the one I mean, we have a. Uh, there's a bar actually at the one in, in Mooresville too, so you can get drinks there. Um, and oh, that's that a beautiful is, spot, by the way. Yeah, it's it's about an hour from where I live, so I don't get up there a lot, but I do get up there, um, and it is very enjoyable place, very relaxing place to go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So in all to the USA, now you have this like conglomeration of a, of these iconic brands, and I kind of we were talking a little before the show. There are some like bread and butter brands that you have under that portfolio. And then you have some like, I think, 
other brands that I would say are more specialty type brands. Let's start yeah. with the bread and butter brands. What would you say on the Altidus are, are the workhorse brands you have right now? Uh, you know, Romeo, Romeo and Julieta is like a monster, you know, Monte Cristo, obviously, uh, A. Cheltman as well. I mean, those three, aside that's from being, was, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Big heritage brands. I mean, they've been around forever, even here in the U.S. States. And, and like you, you go to any shop, I mean, not to say we own the humidor, but we, we definitely have a pretty big presence and, and you know, I don't know, humidor, but, um, they're, they're very strong brands, but like even our smaller brands still like they're pretty good workhorses. You'd be, you'd be amazed to find out how well a lot of these brands do, you know, and, and then also throw in aging room, which, you know, we, we, we don't know, but we distribute and we have that whole partnership with, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big workhorse for us as well. So we're pretty well rounded. No, that's that's true. Um, you know, it, it's it, I was kind of thinking when I was I knew obviously Monte Cristo and Romeo Julieta would be in those workhorse. I was wondering about H. Upman because those seem to be the three every year. You go to a trade show, you'll see something from those brands every year. Yeah, I mean H. Upman, H. Upman is a huge brand, and um, you definitely saw it a lot more in the last two years when the first collaborations happened with AJ Fernandez and the H. Upman Nicaragua came out. That really took it like that. That went next level for for H. Upman, and you know that grew the entire brand portfolio, which is pretty impressive to see. Yeah, I don't want to say it was a surprise hit, but you know it was definitely as successful as what you did with the Monte Cristo AJ collaborations. It was oh, yeah. one of the more wide, you know, higher profile ones for sure. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know it, it's you know it it gave some new life into the brand. Uh, so you saw like the second release of of like that series with Grupo Maestros, the Connecticut that came out this past show, and uh, yep, yep. right, exactly. Great cigar. And then, um, you know, you're going to see some more of that coming out this year as well. No, you know, the one thing that's really interesting, and we're going to dive into some of these other projects. So, uh, but there was one thing that I found very in unique about all to this. And, and maybe this has changed a little since you brought Raphael on board, but this is a company for the most part that has, I, that has really not had a superstar out in the field in terms of, uh, you know, having that, uh, you know, that face, so to speak, it, it's, you've kind of, what, what I, what I've seen is it seems like you've showcased the brands as being, and I think I've heard some of your predecessors say this too. The brands have been always the, 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 the star, not necessarily the people. Is, would you say that was an accurate statement? And, and is that something that's changing right now? Um, no, I think that's accurate. And I, funny, I got this question literally two days ago. Like, what do you prefer? Do you prefer working with companies that have brands or you prefer with companies that have people in? I, I think it's good that we pay homage to these brands and they're the star of the show. Like, yeah, we have personalities. I hit the road a lot. Raphael's a pits. He permanently lives on the road and, and he's, a, he's a huge personality. He's a great guy. And it's cool that we get to go out there and represent these brands, but the brand is basically what's the most important. And it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, you're talking about history. I mean, Monte Cristo, which is one of our younger brands, believe it or not, is from 1935. And, and you see the history of this brand and, you know, groups or teams of people have been able to hold the torch and like market these brands and push them and do do what they do to make them succeed. And it's this is now our turn, you know, and, and we get to hold the torch and, and kind of represent and kind of put our imprint and steer the direction a little bit and it's going to be interesting later on we get to you know in the future way in the future we get to turn back and see whoever else is carrying that torch and, it, and it's going to be great but at the same time it's always monte cristo mm -hmm. you know and and that's that's the beauty or what i see of of the brand like that's what lives and it's great that people like us but i don't think people should buy the cigars because it's us i think people need to buy it because right the brand has proven excellence, quality, you know, it delivers every single time a certain type of experience. And that's what needs to really get pushed out there. And I think there's a difference between 
uh, companies of your size versus smaller brands that are, you know, have started up over the last 10 or 20 years is those newer brands, they have to have a face to build them up. Mm -hmm. People aren't just going to go after a cigar because it's something that they haven't seen before. You know, there's got to be something to kind of engage them. And I'll say that for the majority of smokers, not for the people that are really entrenched and they always want to smoke something new, They'll, they might pick up something that they haven't seen before. But the majority of smokers, the ones who buy the most, are going to gravitate towards stuff that they know they like. They're not going to venture off to a new, a new cigar unless there's something that is very conveying to make them do that. And that's probably a face. Um, right. And another thing that you probably get a lot of is, at least from people that are you know, very into the industry is the comparison between your company and general cigar as well. Yeah. General took a different path. General did put faces to all of the brands and yep. that's starting to fall back now where there's only a couple of brands that maybe have a face, but they've kind of gone away from that. And you kind of guys have stayed steady in that brand forward. Right. And, and successful for you. Yeah. And you know what? I, I think it's good to have, for example, brand ambassadors, right? So I, I look at other industries and what's something I really look at is spirits. And I think it's great that there's a brand ambassador out there connecting with the people because you do got to humanize it, mm -hmm. right? And, and that does build brand loyalty, but you got to walk a very fine line to make sure that, hey, man, it's not the Eddie show. It's still the Monte Cristo show. You know what I mean? Yep. So because, I mean, God forbid, Eddie might not be here forever obviously right. you know so you got to make sure that the brand always lives on and um it's and it's kind of like paying homage so it's like you got to respect the history it, it made it this far it's got to continue to grow and again it's just people need to you know respect the brand and, and and see you know really push it and but that's why the brand also needs to deliver on quality it needs to deliver on every experience possible in, in the background, though, you have this superstar team, um, kind of these unsung heroes, but they're your superstars, the Grupo de Maestros there. And I've noticed in the last few years, the, the Altidus has started to maybe not put them out at events, but started to showcase that, hey, we have this all-star team behind the scenes who are, who are coming up with these blends and rolling these cigars and producing them. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? These guys are... They are kind of like dunks and heroes. These guys are all uh, geniuses in their own right. And I mean, you know, people can say what they want. Like we still make cigars in a ultra premium way. And what these guys have helped create and maintain as a product and the quality of the product should speak volumes because what they've created sells hundreds of millions, you know, so they're you know, people just still deserve that recognition. And it's also great, again, to humanize, uh, you know, we're not, yes, we're this big company and, but we still do things the old fashioned, like family type wave. Are you, you've been, have you been to our factory? I have not. So it's the largest cigar factory in the world, which by the way, we're celebrating 50 years uh, this year. Yes. And, um, it's huge. But if you go in there and you go into the premium, it's still done the good old fashioned way, TLC, all handmade and putting the maestros out there helps kind of put that into the public. Like, dude, this is a machine. It's like, this is, this is Pedro Ventura right here. You know, you're smoking what, you know, what he's helped develop and create. So it's something we're going to continue doing for sure. No, and, and like I said, I, I kind of in this age where, and I'll get in trouble for saying this, you know, someone can just go down to a factory and call themselves a master blender, right? Yeah, absolutely. You've got this team there that these are the these are the real deal is kind of what I'm saying, and I think it I think it was a really good thing when Alta started. Maybe okay, not put them out on events, but hey, start start letting people aware of of, of this team you have. No, absolutely. And, and you know what? That dynamic has also changed for the better now because, I mean, out of nowhere now comes, I say out of nowhere, but Rafael Nodal joins the company. And now you have his flavor profile and what he's done. And then he gets together with these guys and he gets together with also like AJ and Placencia. And the quality of tobacco has 
gone through the roof, you know, and, and that's, I don't know. It, it's, it's an interesting time to be a part of the company. I'll tell you that it's, it's pretty awesome. It's definitely, it's definitely a change you have there for sure. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned tobacco Alerta Garcia, you're celebrating 50 years. You also have the uh, Florida Copan factory in Honduras, right? Yeah. You got two, like, again, great factories. Why now start seeking some of these other factories to collaborate with right now when you, so, you know, have the best out there would be my question. Well, no, that's, that's a great question. I get it all the time. And, um, it's, it's actually quite a simple answer. You know, we, we're huge in the Dominican Republic. We're huge in uh, Honduras. The one thing we never had prior to all these collaborations, and we never had a footprint in Nicaragua. And that's very important for our company because that's what the market is demanding right now. Right. So, and you can't just, at, at, at the volume that we, put cigars out, you can't just go into a, a mom and pop shop and you can't, you know, it's also, you don't just open up a factory because you feel like it. Right. So why not find two of the biggest partners and probably two of the best manufacturers in the world to, to sit down and develop our Nicaraguan footprint with their factories, you know? Um, and it's working, you know, so we finally have our Nicaraguan footprint, like our Nicaraguan origin coming out. And we, you know, we're strong in DR as always. And, and the same thing in the Florida Capone and Honduras. So we feel now we cover all three territories that, uh, that people want. And you've picked two, I mean, partners that not only have production capability, but, but tobacco, like you said earlier in, in Nestor Placencia and AJ Fernandez. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, me have you know, the, I feel like Placencia owns Nicaragua. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> they, they own everything, but they're they're you know one of the biggest growers out there. They they manufacture unbelievable cigars, and you know not just for us, but for everybody else that they manufacture for for themselves. I mean, they're great, and they're partners that understand our vision and what we want to do, and we work closely together. And then you have. You know, AJ, who's another monster grower and kind of like a mad scientist in the way he ferments and he ages his tobacco. And he's definitely, I always say this a lot, like evolve or die. That's like kind of like how I think about marketing and especially in this business. This is definitely a man that kind of has taken that approach. Like he's gotten all these old school traditions and, and he's evolved into doing things his own way. And, and it's, guy's a genius and, and he's a monster and he's, he's only getting better. So, and, and the result, you could, you can see the results in the tobacco, right? That everyone smokes and they move. So we're, we're very, very happy with, with our two partnerships over there. And I mean, <laughs> it's going to keep on going. We're going to keep on winning, I guess, you know? Yeah. And I have to imagine that, uh, the, especially the partnership with AJ Fernandez has probably opened you guys up to a kind of a new market. Cause he, he had a, he had a following already. And then, you know, you guys collaborating, that's just another portfolio of cigars that are now available to the people that enjoy kind of what AJ has done. Well, yeah, absolutely. So like you have people like, you know how it is. We are in shops all the time and you, I only smoke Dominican or, I only smoke Nicaraguan. I mean, I was one of those guys that you know, I only smoke Nicaraguan just because I, at one point, my palate, that's just what I required. And, and that signature Nicaraguan flavor, I mean, that man does it better than anybody else, right? And he has his own following. And, and it, it really kind of opened up the door for an entirely new market. So you've seen the growth of the brand. And what's great about that, right? So. You know, we have, you know, Monte Cristo Nicaragua by AJ Fernandez that a lot of people that weren't really Monte smokers anymore because their palate changes kind of came back to the franchise. And, and you know what? Man, I used to really love that Monte Cristo Platinum. Let me try it again. And it, it's kind of it's helped grown, you know, and put life into all of our other brands, too. So it's interesting. I was I was down in Nicaragua in um this is two years ago in 17 February. I was with a bunch of folks from on an Espinosa cigar trip, and we went over to AJ's factory. And we're walking through the factory, and, and I start, you know, I'm taking pictures, and I, I happen to take pictures of the Gisper and the and the H. Upman. So AJ sees me do this, and he goes, 
no social media, right? <laughs> right? He was like, he goes, he goes, I get in big trouble, right? Yeah. So, but what he did afterwards is he actually handed us the cigars, some of the Gisbert's and some of the uh, Chapman's, and we smoked them. And what I noticed was some of these guys who maybe were not smokers of those brands saying, hey, you know what? This is a cigar I definitely want to pick up when I when I get back to the States and it comes out. Um, so there yeah. was, you know, some folks liked one more than the other, which was pretty interesting or both. But it, it did exactly what you said, you know, just from doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what's, what I find interesting is how, you know, AJ and Placencia and our group of maestros and Rafael Nodal kind of like how they all communicate and collaborate. So it's like a bunch of mad scientists in a room. You literally have like the best in the business, like get together in a room and work on tobacco that I get to market and sell. It's, 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 it's just, when you see it, it's almost like there's so much brain power, like the place is going to explode. It's just, whoa, it's, it's something. And you look at both of those 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 partners you mentioned. Now they have their footprint on brands such as Monte Cristo, H. Upman, uh, Romeo Julieta. I mean, so it's from their standpoint, they're working on some really again iconic brands that these just like the best of the best here. So it's I think it's a great opportunity for them as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then you also got to take into the personal. Like, there's like personal attachment. Kind of like how I have personal attachment of like, man, you know, I'm Cuban American, family grew Cuba, uh, tobacco in Cuba. Like, there's there's some working with these famous Cuban heritage brands. Like, there's some pride there. Like, there's something you got to honor. And then think of somebody like AJ who is born in Cuba and left, and he's this monster tobacco guy, and he now gets to work with these brands that he grew up with and always kind of like looked up to, and, and now he's making them and he's yeah. crushing. Them. And and the same thing with Placencia. I mean, their families rich history you know rich cuban history as well and it's interesting there's there's a little bit of extra you know i don't want to speak for anyone but you could tell like there's there's a little bit of extra pride that goes into making those cigars that's true now i would say about three years three or four years ago altus went in a little bit of a different direction and it really mm -hmm. started before rafael joined the company when um when you worked on the romeo uh the Romeo Aging Room, and then you had the Henry Clay Tattoo. You had these smaller batch projects that you started uh, working on. Yeah. And what it's has that is that something that that Altidus is like continuing to do right now, or is it something that there is. yeah, is, it, it, yeah, okay. So, I mean, so it's, it's a it's a little tricky, you know, considering everything that's going on. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But uh, that's that's definitely something that um, we're we're working on. There's not much I can say. That's okay. But uh, it is happening. Uh, I think 2020 is going to be an interesting year. I'll just leave it at that. But uh, <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. But you, interesting thing. So Henry Clay Tattoo is one that that um, I think was an interesting project because. I thought it kind of sprung, it kind of brought back, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. You know, I'm talking to Henry Clay Warhawk. It kind of brought back Henry Clay. It kind of was a springboard into some projects yeah. that you've done with Henry Clay now afterwards. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, Henry Clay, which was, you know, at one point um, one of Pete's favorite cigars, and that kind of has this, you know, rich American history. And, yeah. you know, he, I wasn't a part of the company at that time, but I was, you know, First and foremost, we, like I'm a cigar smoker, I, like I'm in the humidors, I'm the customer. So when that came out, I, I definitely grabbed a, a box and it, it definitely brought me to the brand. And it's interesting the effect of that because Henry Clay developed like this cult following, if you will. And there's people that like, just the, you know, we know a couple other brands out there. They have their cult following. I mean, Henry Clay has that. Yeah. And um, we did a follow up to Tattoo on our own, no collaboration with the Stock Cut, which was you know it was pretty similar in, in profile, and it kept that whole tradition of Henry Clay being this Connecticut broadleaf thing, and um, the brand soared. So, um, which you know, you and I were talking earlier when when I when I joined the company and they're kind of like, well, what brands do you want to work with? 
you know, Henry Clay was like, was like Henry Clay right away. That's definitely one of them. And uh, I mean, you're smoking what happened, <laughs> which we can get into that whenever you want. But like yeah, that we'll, was, we'll, uh, yeah. we'll hit that a little bit. Yep. A very different approach, which is kind of what I want to do with this whole Evolver Die thing. Yeah, and then you you also took some like I mean, there was a lot of great stuff with Monte Cristo. I could tell you that that Artisan Batch Number One, which you released for the TAA. Um, I didn't tell you this before the show. If you haven't smoked Artisan Batch Number One, like with with some age on it, smoke it. Um, that that cigar was the was the hidden surprise of last year's TAA. I'm just telling you straight out, it was fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, you've had some great projects uh, in the day too. Yeah, no, it, it's. It's it's great, man. I I I have you know, I have I have a couple of them over here, and I I, I hit them from time to time. They're uh, yeah. I, I try not to smoke too many of them because since it was you know the batch the batch one happened went away, we brought it back for TAA, and that kind of like sold out. So like you know, you know a lot of people when they do these limited releases, limited you know that ironically they hang around for ten years. <laughs> uh, this. These these truly are limited. So once they're gone, they're gone. So I try not to smoke as many of them as as I'd like. But if if you can if you can find them in the stores, I I tell you, grab them. Yep. No, I agree. Um, there was another small batch product. Again, this was a this was a really different one that you guys did. And I don't I don't know. This may have happened before you came to the company, but I think it's a very unique product. The one you did with Crown Heads, the the cute out of Musica. Yeah. Is, so you work with Crown Heads, and then you pick another partner in Ernesto Perez Carrillo Jr., uh, Tobacco Laro La Alianza, to produce that cigar. Yeah, that's – I had one earlier. Uh, again, that's another – like, these small back projects, like, for me, like, that's what I love. It's, it's I guess, the tobacco geek in me. But um, they really – they work in two aspects. One, like, people really get to – see that we still put the love and care into doing like really cool things and but it also again opens up an entire new audience for us so um that did happen before that happened literally um they did the announcement like two weeks before i joined mm -hmm. it's pretty funny so i had nothing to do with that i just i smoked a lot of them <laughs> <laughs> but it was really cool like man you have you know john huber and then you have like epc right to who really badass people, right? And and they get to do something with the Monte Cristo name, and it was an interesting project. It, it was, and it was a it was a very good cigar too. Actually, that was I know I think it was, it was on my top twenty five. I'm not sure Aaron was. If it it was on as well. Yeah, yeah I mean. By the way, that that is actually um, going to be around for a while. Good. And oh, nice. To be, we're gonna open it up to. You know, originally it was only meant for certain retailers and Casa de Monte Cristos. And, you know, eventually you get the amount of requests where you're just like, yeah, we kinda, it's been around for a year now. I think we could release it to, to everybody. So you'll, you'll, you'll see a lot of it in the near future. That's yes. awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about some, some things that's happened over the last year. Um, and there's been some big successes. I guess we'll, we'll kind of kick it right off with Monte Cristo Nicaragua. I mean, that was a, a showcase brand at the show. Um, and it 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 gets it lands you guys a top 10 rating uh, in aficionado last year. Yeah, that, that to me, um, that, I don't know, I, I love that cigar. Uh, I found it interesting. You know, and the, what I find interesting about that cigar is when you figure that it was made at AJ, right? Like, you think it's going to have that typical AJ Fernandez, like, pump. And what I find interesting is he really kind of paid homage to the brand and, and was like, Monte Cristo isn't that. Monte Cristo is still, at the end of the day, a very elegant, refined smoke. You know, so he was able to still give that Nicaraguan spice and flavor and edge to it. So, you, you know, like, hey, man, I'm smoking a Nicaraguan cigar, but it wasn't overpowering. It was, you know, I, I like to describe it as elegant. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but that is, it was, and, and it showed in the ratings, you know, uh, all across the board and a lot of uh, sites and publications, people gave it high ratings. People love it. It's flying off the shelves and, I mean, we're definitely a winner. It was a great way to, I think, round out the 
classic line, you know, so you, you've had the classic, the white, the platinum, and we hadn't done anything because you don't really fix anything that's not broken. So like eight years or something passed before we actually said, oh, you know what, I think it's time that the, the classic series of Monte Cristo gets a Nicaraguan footprint, and that's what happened. Yeah, I was going to kind of say that's kind of different than what he did with the Monte. Like, Monty's kind of a different offshoot of that brand. As a right. Classic. He, and you know what? Like, a lot of people ask me, they're like, why? Like, what's the difference between Monte <laughs> Cristo and Monty by Monte Cristo? Right? Which, by the way, is kind of like a question that I had a long time ago. And I, now being in the company, I get it. And it's something that we're going to really market to, to get the message out there. But Monty by Monte Cristo is – Kind of like a more cutting edge version. It's kind of you know, uh, of the brand. You know, entry level would not be the right word to describe it, but it, it's used as a way to attract people to the brand. Where you're not getting a true Monte Cristo, you're getting a Monty by Monte Cristo. So it's our way to be wild and and kind of experiment and say, hey man, we're gonna put out this cigar with AJ, and it's gonna be spicy. It's gonna be bold and boom, Nicaragua, but it's still not refined enough to be called a classic Monte Cristo. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's interesting, and then that's the same thing that happened with the you know Monte by Monte Cristo original from DR. You know, it's it was definitely a change in flavor profile, like that was way left field. And you know, I don't know when was the last time you had one of those cigars, but that to me is one of the best cigars we have in our portfolio. I I can tell you, I smoke a lot of the white. Um, I know a guy who's a a full bodied smoker, and he's 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 about my dad's age. And he, he really only smokes full body, except when he wants a, a light shade cigar, he goes to Monty White. Yeah. And he keeps a he keeps a regular supply. He's one of the guys I say – I say a lot of guys don't have a true cigar rotation. He's This guy truly has a cigar rotation, and he has those whites uh, several times a week. So uh, it absolutely – Thank you to him. I mean, it, it, it is a great cigar, though. Like the Monty White is the classic. Like Those are cigars you literally can't have every day. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, they're – Amazing. I mean, it'd be pretty expensive to have one every day, but you know, <laughs> they definitely keep that profile of just like that's that to me is the classic cigar smokers cigar. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, that's uh, I would agree. Now, on the other end, you you went and I think the, like this is Placencia, the uh, Romeo Julieta eighteen seventy five Nicaragua. Yeah. That was a surprise hit. I mean, maybe a lot of guys who, who watch the show, the boutique guys, don't realize that. But that cigar, I could tell you from talking to my retailers, it has been a huge hit. That that. Uh, what, were, was, what were you guys looking for with that cigar? Well, probably was our biggest hit of the year. Like yeah, it's, yeah. It's like, um, I mean the the Romeo Julieta 1875 brand. I mean, uh. Don't I would probably say it's the biggest volume brand that we have for for premium. Um, it's just it's been around forever. It's you know our tagline is like it's America's love affair, right? So, and again, it's it's reinforcing that we felt like our core brands needed a Nicaraguan footprint. So you had to stay also. Like in brand and, and honor again the tradition of Romeo and Julieta, like there is nothing strong there really in, in the 1875 range. So how do you create a Nicaraguan cigar that's not gonna blow your face off and it's still easy going and everyone can smoke it? And I mean I'm I'm gonna say that no doubt getting together with Placencia on that, like that was like a home run, like Grand Slam. It's mm -hmm. people blind test that cigar all the time and they're just blown away when they see the price point behind it and they find out what it is. They're just like, wow, this is an 1875 Nicaragua. Like, wow. So it, it's, we're, we're really happy with that. Yeah. And it was, again, the price point was good. It's a, I mean, you guys had done the, uh, the Romeo with AJ Fernandez. Yeah. Um, how I mean is how would you again kind of separate Romeo by Romeo and Julieta from the regular Romeo and Julieta line? Is it similar to what you just said with Mon with the Monty? Yeah, so th those are basically those two are basically the same type of vehicles for for their parent brands. So like Romeo 
is definitely the more cutting edge. You can get a little bit more experimental. And I don't know if you remember back when the original Romeo came out, the red and white split yep. this box. But like, it got amazing ratings. It was like number three cigar of the year at the time. But fantastic smoke. But when people smoked it, they were just like, dude, this is not like what we're used to in terms of like Romeo Julieta. Like, this is just so much more forward thinking and so much more aggressive. Like, everyone fell in love with it. But that's what, but since it was such a different cigar, like it had to carry its own type of platform. And then, you know, we followed up with, with everything else, you know, AJ last year did the Romeo San Andres, which is a powerhouse smoke. And again, that's where he can really showcase his power. If he wants to do those aggressive Nicaraguan smokes, I mean, that's it. And that's why it's a Romeo versus a, a traditional Romeo Julieta. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So the other, the uh, next cigar, uh, this came out of the show. Um, this is the uh, H. Altman Grupo de Maestros. Uh, this was in. This was a, is an anniversary cigar, right? This was to celebrate a hundred and. Well, so what it is, five years, right? Five, right? So this year we'll, we will be doing like the official celebration of it, right? That's to say. Uh, but it was, you know, when you're gonna come up like, now, think about it. If you notice that series with the yellow stripe, it's very similar to the AJ that has the blue stripe, right? So, like, that's now a Chapman's pillar of being experimental and, and more aggressive and, and kind of appealing to the modern consumer versus the traditional consumer that already consumes a Chapman. So, we have to find a pretty good follow up to the AJ, you know, which. So that this is when you when you task the group of maestros be like, hey, you guys are the best in the business. Come up with something that is Connecticut, not full bodied, but like full flavored. I mean, and it's a very different Connecticut than what you're used to. I could I you know, flavor wise. Um and, and they nailed it. And another like last year was home runs all the way around with all of our releases where I can tell you we're pretty happy with the results. Why Why put a Connecticut shade, though, in the Upman? This is my question, and I'm not criticizing this. It's a question. Why put a Connecticut shade, though, in the Upman line when you have, like, such a strong Connecticut shade line, for example, like with, Monte, with a lot of the Monte Cristos? What, what, what would you do in H. Upman to kind of differentiate that? Well, I think you got to look at each brand like they're their own company. You know, if you're an yeah. H. Upman, Smoker, you're an H. Upman smoker. You don't think, well, it's a taxi and all to this cigar, so let me see what else they have in our portfolio. I mean, I, you know, H. Upman is H. Upman. And there's people that smoke H. Upman that do not smoke Monty, that do not smoke Romeo, or there's new people that go around, but each company also has its own flavor profile. So, like, the H. Upman Connecticut shade tastes nothing like the Monte Cristo Connecticut well, shade. I agree with that. Yeah, that I would agree with. <laughs> you know, and um, H. Upman needed it. You know, also let call a spade a spade. It's it's the high selling rapper in the business. Yep. People, people love it, you know. It's, and you know, we wanted to play around with it and um I mean the results were great. It's definitely a different style of flavor. It's got a lot of pilotico in it, which is something we haven't really done before. Um and the group of maestros, like they felt strong enough, like like we're putting our name on this officially. <laughs> yeah, it definitely was a a more contemporary uh, style Connecticut. Um, even even with the with the little uh, the Maduro cap, I mean, I tr when I smoke it, I try to take a little less of the cap off. Sometimes I'll even punch this cigar, right? Yeah. I try to get a little bit of that wrapper on the uh, you know that little bit of that cap on the taste profile. And I find it makes a kind of, you know, kind of, I don't know if it's my mind playing games, but I, but I feel like it's leading me into the cigar a little different than maybe a traditional uh, Connecticut shade is. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And it might be a mental thing. I don't know, but I, yeah. I, I have the same feeling. Um, that cigar, that blend was interesting, man, because you have Pilotigo in it. You have, I mean, we got uh, Esteli tobacco from Placencia that's in it, you know, and the, it's... You know the the shade is great, so like that whole it really balances everything out. So it's just a nice, full flavored Connecticut. I like to say. Yep. No. So speaking of Connecticut, uh, we'll we'll talk about in a little more in depth. I'm um, smoking this one, uh, the Warhawk. So this again, you kind of go with Henry Clay, and 
introduced the Connecticut Shade into Henry Clay. I heard a lot of rave reviews about this cigar um, from people who were down at TAA. Yeah, I mean, this is a very exciting project. Like, this was a kind of like a pet project of mine, and um, you know, I, I I looked at the portfolio of Henry Clay and and how it had his whole cult following, and then I started looking at the history of. I mean, who who I, I really felt like you should delve into the person that it's named after, right? So, like, who was he? And he was pretty much a rebellious dude in his own right. Like, he was the leader of the Warhawks, which they still exist today. And that's, you know, how it got its name, right? We're going to pay homage to, to his life. And you're, you're going to see, you're going to see that in the next few years, this is going to be like the first of like three series. Yeah. I was going to say it's a trilogy. Yeah. You know, so, um, and looking at me like, man, we've only, we've only done Connecticut broadly frappers and this might be a little risky, but I feel like, Let's give him something different. Let's, you know, he's rebellious. Why don't we be rebellious? Let's go completely left field. And at the same time, there's a lot of people that don't smoke broadleaf because it's too strong or whatnot, or they're afraid of it because of the color, but everybody smokes Connecticut. So what a better way to have people kind of jump into the Henry Clay franchise by like saying, hey, look, now you have a nice, you know, this is actually a Ecuadorian Connecticut. Um, and you know let's do that and the blend's interesting you know it does have a broadleaf binder though. Mm -hmm. so, so you keep to the tradition of henry Clay yeah you have that flavor but like people don't see the broadleaf binder so but they're getting that flavor it's in there. right um and then you have uh you know some honduran creole no and in the in the fillers and you know the goal behind this product was like i want a connecticut but, and I don't know if you retrohaled at the beginning of this smoke, but like, it is spicy. It is. Yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it'll zing you, man. And it's, it's definitely a stronger Connecticut than the average Connecticut cigar. And uh, price points are fair. We kept it simple with three Vitolas. So we're doing a Corona, we're doing a Robusto and a Toro. No reason to get complicated. Right. Um, change the design. I kind of went back and did some history uh with our team and uh yep we recreated the cuban band i i yep this to me this was yeah <laughs> that was the best feature of the packaging i liked was yeah. this yes i so, love that style yeah and, and i i thought i thought it would be a cool touch you know and um so far it's a winner i mean it's only been out for a week so but in a week, the amount of sales that have happened and the response and the reviews that we're getting, I mean, it looks like this is going to be a big winner for the year and it looks like it's going to be around for a while. Um, I don't know. I, I personally love it, but I might be a little bit biased because this was also like one of my pet projects. But, you know, I, I feel like no doubt when I explained to him the project of what I was looking for, like he, I spoke to him for maybe 15 minutes and he just kind of like stopped me mid tracks. He's like, I got it. <laughs> I'll I bring call. it. Don't worry. You know, like, and first round of, of test blends came back and I was like, yeah, you got it. All right. You know, so, uh, you know, it was a good team effort. Everyone kind of understood the vision, which we were happy about. No, that's really good. That's really good. And and so the other thing I'm happy about it, which being rebellious and, and following up with all that is we're really going to change the marketing technique of what you've probably seen for all to this. And this is, you know, uh, you know, you, as you, you're aware, there's a new marketing team there. So yes. we have Brad, who's been with the company for years, but he moved into the marketing side and he's now our VP of marketing. And I joined the team and uh, we have... Uh, couple wonderful people that joined as well um, and we're all I don't want to say new school thought but we're all pretty aggressive in terms of like let's do different and let's change the game and let's show them that we're here to like really be aggressive so if you notice the marketing behind it like the images that we're putting out it's something very different than what you're probably used to seeing from the company so uh, I I was the last two years I've been at the Great Smoke. I saw you there last year, and I was there again this year. And the approach that you guys took to an event like the Great Smoke, 
was yeah. was very different than the other big companies is what I'll just say. Uh, your whole team was out there or, you know, a lot of your key guys are out there and you were kind of you kind of had visiting your table was kind of a very intimate experience is what I'm going to say, too. And, and that, so it's shown the last two years where you go over to the Altidus table. Um, it, it you know, it wasn't like you felt like you were just handed a cigar and go to the next table. The, the, no, there was, there was a lot of engagement going on there from from Rob Norris to everyone who was there. I mean, think about that. I mean, yeah. the presidency of the company shows up to the great smoke just that, you know, we want to really connect with handing out cigars. He was the guy handing out the cigars. It was really interesting. Right. And, and, and in reality, he, he assembled this team, you know, he's. Right analytical smart man you know and and he uh this is also his vision like he wants to humanize and and he's also very against the grain kind of guy you know so he assembled a team and we all have our vision that's kind of like in the same path and it's i don't know i like to see like it's it's showing i think and i people are responding quite well to it and you know, the events are going to be very different. You're going to see for Henry Clay, like when we're going to start rolling out this activation of like, we're no longer going to do events when it comes to these really cool brands where it's just like, Hey man, show up to the shop, you know, by three, you're going to get one. Like that's not an event, man. That's, that's a deal. That's a deal. Right. Yeah. Right. You no. Know, so, but a lot of people do that as events. Like we really want people to walk away with an experience. And that's like be many different ways, like educational, pairings we're going to work with liquor companies with chocolate companies with coffee companies we're going to really kind of give you a full experience like music and like it's it's just i don't know it, it's it's kind of hard to describe right now but again if, if you see the ad you kind of notice the demographic that we're going for you know it's not a traditional ad of what you see in the cigar company normally people put a picture of a cigar in a tobacco field in the background and it's like cut and paste right everybody does this like we're really taking a very different approach and it's exciting. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, some of the stuff you're doing with packaging and, um, last week, big announcement, you mentioned that it's a hundred, uh, it's 50 years of tobacco Lerda Garcia. Yeah. So you have a cigar that's coming out, uh, under the Monte Cristo line. It's going to pay homage to that. Yeah. So that, <laughs> that, uh, definitely was a big difference in packaging, you know, and definitely something that, uh, I was given a little bit of uh, freedom and leeway to kind of present something to the team. And, you know, we're the largest, uh, Tabaco Lera Garcia is the largest factory in the world. 50 years is like something, it's a big deal, right? So how do, how do you pay homage to that and make it look different and interesting? And so uh, we're going to come out with a cigar for it, obviously. And it's going to, we're going to come out with two of them. So same blend, two different formats. We're gonna come out with a humidor uh, that we worked on together with uh, Ellie Blue, which, I mean, that speaks for itself. I mean, you're talking about companies that make boxes for Louis Vuitton and things like that, like they're Ellie Blue. So uh, we custom fitted a hundred cigars in it. They're gonna be a box press number two. Um, and that we're only coming out with 75 of those. That's it. Um, and then we're going to come out with a 10 count box that's piano finishing, almost kind of like a humidor in itself, believe it or not. But it's it's a 10 count. And that's going to fit a uh, 6 by 50 Toro. And, you know, the task was it's 50 years, man. Come out with the best cigar you could possibly come out with from that factory. And, you know, Nodal was there with the Grupos. I mean, he worked on this thing for months and months and months. And I don't know, you know, if, if you were able to get your hands. We passed him out at the TAA just as a sneak peek, like, smoke the cigar, check out the band. The band was also, like, another piece of artwork that we did. And I don't know if you got to smoke one, but it's – it's. I did not. Um, But I saw the picture start going up, and then – uh. You know, and there were people at the TAA posting pictures of that. Um, and that was one of the cigars I saw more prominently photographed for sure. Is this a regular? I know the humidor is limited, but is this a regular production line? No. Um, as of right now, it's, you know, 8,000 boxes and that's it. Wow. Um, and again, try to, you know, keep true to that. 
it's yeah. One of my friends who's listening right now, I know he's, he's listening. Um, he commented on the humidor and he, he basically compared that humidor. And when you look at it, he says, this is like what Padron did. And this is a spectacular humidor. If you haven't seen the pictures of it, uh, it really is a work of art. I got to agree. Oh, it is. And you know what I love about it? You know, Ellie Blue, like you see the artwork on it, but that's not, that's not like digitally printed and then like piano finished over. Like oh. that is 100% marquetry. Every piece, every detail on there is a cut piece of wood that they hammer in place. And it's a truly handmade humidor. And th that's why it carries the price tag, you know? Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's not going to be, um, the price tag is worthy of 50 years. That's great. That's great. So Aaron, uh, any more questions on some projects? Those are a few more brands. I wanted to kind of, uh, do some quick hits with it. Yeah, let's hit those brands. Okay, so Eddie, you and I talked before the show about my uh, affinity for Vega Fina, <laughs> um, and 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 we talked about the Añejo Seven Años. Who Aaron and I just we really like that cigar. Yep. Um, but Vega Fina, uh, I think it's one of the. How can I put? It? It's I think it's one of the unks. I know it's big in Europe, and I told you about when I smoked the stall cut in Sweden. Yeah, I think it's one of your unsung heroes. I think it's uh, if Americans haven't paid attention to that brand, they really should. No, I agree. Um, again, it's it's huge overseas. It's you know it's here in the states. It does all right, um, but it's definitely one of the unsung heroes. But you know, as a consumer, I really wouldn't sleep on that brand because it's pretty amazing. Um, originally, it was blended for like a overseas palette if you will i guess is the best way to put it i don't want to make claims that isn't true but i'm, I'm you know uh, i'm gonna say that but um i love it and uh, parts of me wishes that those european releases got to get released in the united states because i mean that's that stock cuts unbelievable the the year of the pig was unbelievable the, the grand reserve of 2019 is unbelievable and they, they you know Came out of the Pilotigo that's I haven't smoked yet, but it's supposed to be pretty pretty amazing. But if you can get your hands on the, the Siete Años, I mean that to me is probably one of my favorite cigars I've ever smoked. Really? Mm -hmm. I that one I haven't smoked. No, the seven years yes, you have. Oh no, I thought you said oh I thought you said the Siete. I, okay, I'm thinking I'm sorry, okay, yeah. seven Años. That's that's my no, it's me. Uh, that's, oh, that's, that's his white boy, you know. That's what, look, yeah, exactly. That's the gringo comes up. <laughs> uh, number three cigar of the year for me last year. It was a, it, that cigar. I mean, I know I, I started telling the guys, you guys got to smoke. I think Aaron had already smoked it, but I know mm. Aaron's partner, Seth, I got him on. I said, this cigar is legit. I mean, this was just a home run. It if is. you haven't smoked it, it my goodness. <laughs> And you know what? It's at a great price point too. Really, exactly. The value is it. it was it's a cigar, cigar that punches above the price point. Number one value cigar on my list last year. Yeah, number one. It was a blowout for number one value last year. Yeah, no, that that cigar for me, like when when I first joined the company, and um, I'm I'm sitting with I don't you may know Travis or not. He's like our national education manager, and uh, so I joined the company. I'm sitting with him in the office. We're having a cigar, and he's like, "Hey, man." You had the seven years big Fina before, and I was like, no. Right, so he's like, try this thing. I'm my, I was like, how much is this thing? And he he tells me the price. I was like, wow, that is unbelievable. Yeah, I don't I don't know how this thing is still in stock. I, exactly. Like, yeah, that was kind of what I I was like. You yeah. guys got to try this cigar. Yeah, so and it's funny, like you look at everybody who reviews cigars and also this cigar constantly ranks in the high nineties in every platform. And it's just like you know, I, I, I feel like it's something that really should be embraced a little bit more, but everyone's got a different palette. Maybe people just don't know. I I don't know, but like Vega Fina is one of those brands that's man, for the price points, amazing everyday cigars, and there's some really great quality there. Yeah, I mean, I used to, again, when I was starting out, I smoked a lot of those original white label ones, um, which were, you know, fantastic price point, good good intro cigar for me um, Yeah. At, at that price point where I just, yeah, they, they were just, they were, it was a great every day. And then, you know, you came out with the Sumum, which was really good as well um, in yeah. 2010. I think that kind of 
change things up a bit for Vega Fina. Uh, it gave it a little pop for a while. There was an old Jose Cejas one that was another great cigar going back a few, many years already. So there's some really good brand. I mean, like I said, if if that stock cut ever, I mean, I can't wait to go back to Europe just to get some more stock cuts. Uh, it's but funny, man. This, speaking of old school Jose Cejas, man, I got this is an old Jose Cejas right here. It's funny yeah. to mention that. Uh, you're going to see actually a lot of these older Vega Finas kind of come back, though. That's great. That is really uh, good news. You're gonna see them come back. Um, hold it down a little more. I can't just hold that. It was yeah, yeah. Right. So um, you'll see them come back in uh, a lot of Casa Monte Cristos. So that's gonna be interesting. That would be good. That would be really good. I think it would be uh, you know good value there to definitely check those out. Yeah, absolutely. I noticed another brand that you kind of uh, – maybe it's, I believe this was a project of yours. Is you kind of re-imaged Onyx a bit, uh, another brand that was kind of maybe people forgot about, and you kind of highlighted that right before the show. Uh, another great line that – you know, like, to be honest, I kind of forgot about it, and then kind of you gave it a, a nice facelift at the show. Yeah, that was uh, – I think that was the first project I worked on when I joined the company. Um, you know, that, that cigar is interesting because – that cigar was the highest rated cigar we've ever had by Cigar Aficionado. Like it was a 94. Yeah, I, rem I remember. And why I find that cigar interesting is because, you know, people look at this broadleaf and we all do it, even though we know the business and we know how it is. Like you just see this dark cigar and you're just like, oof, that's strong, man. I'm not in the mood for a strong cigar right now. I need, you know, I need something. <laughs> I mean, lunch yet or whatever, whatever it may be, but that cigar kind of borders on mild to medium. So yeah, it's, it's and what I like about that. And it was very different for me because I haven't never really experienced something like that as a smoker, but it was the first time that I truly understood the sweetness of Maduro, like to its fullest potential. Like that cigar was like chocolate with my coffee in the mornings so like you could really have a beautiful maduro great flavor and not kind of like get that nicotine high where you're like man i need to eat something like it was really like mild to medium great 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 flavor like i call it my friends like once they're friends like, i call it my dessert cigar i'm like yeah i need my dessert cigar right now like we just say it's just not offensive chocolatey earthy delicious and um, it's been around forever, and we, we restyled it um, because there's a plan moving forward. We are going to be coming out with some new Onyxes, and we're going to put some, some life back into the brand. And it still sells quite well, believe it or not, but um, it's just a brand that we have identified that, hey, man, this really can succeed in the market if we expand upon this kind of – you know, technique of like, let's make great flavors that don't blow you away. You know, there, there's something here. There's something here that not many people do. So let's just continue with that and, and push it. So there's there's a plan for that. Nice. that that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Aaron, any other brand you want to hit? Mm, nothing. I, I'm sure we're missing something. I'm not sure oh. what, we're, what we're missing. Mm. I got one more. I mean, I got two more. Uh, Trinidad and St. Louis Ray. Mm -hmm. Bam. I love that Broadleaf St. Louis Ray you guys came out with a couple years ago. That was, a, that was a hidden, another hidden, like, really good cigar. Yeah, so, like, that, those are two brands that I manage as well. So um, I can speak on both of them quite a bit. But I think the one that I'm actually most excited about is what we're going to do with uh, Trinidad this year. So Trinidad will see some more light this year, which is I great. mean Trinidad, you're going to see, I mean, shortly you'll start seeing some stuff, but uh I don't I don't even know how to describe it. This is and I was telling you before the show, this is where the creative freedom was like let loose and uh we wanted to work, you know, we're busy selling cigars, but we never sell experiences. So we're really going to roll out this amazing Trinidad experience that I don't think has ever been 
it's happened in this industry, right? So like brand new packaging, that's unbelievable. Uh, brand new concept. I mean, we even went as far as really making an immersive experience when you when we have events. You know, you're going to walk away and you're going to feel like you were totally in a different place. You weren't even in the shop that you were at. Uh, you're going to be able to, like I told you, which I can say one thing now if, without releasing too much information, but if you go to, there's a website which we'll release soon. We're going to have our own Spotify uh, music uh, channel. Okay. You know, so, and that that's going to be interesting because we're going to really start connecting all the elements and all the senses into promoting a certain type of cigar experience. So there's going to be music on there, which probably never heard before, but you're going to like, it, and it's going to tie everything in together and it's going to be perfect smoking music. So when you leave this event or whatnot, you're going to be like, man, I wish I could hear that. And you're going to have access to three hours of music to listen to your car. Or you can be at your house when you're hanging with your buddy smoking and you're gonna be like, dude, let's light up a Trinidad, let's pop on the music. And like, we're back there. Nice. And that is going to be, I don't know, I'm very excited about this project. This is something it's, we worked on it the entire year. The team came together and it's, it's going to be different, man. The advertising is going to be different. Like, it's, I don't know how else to say it, but Trinidad is going to get a huge push this year. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad to see it because that's, you know, I liked what you did with, with the Santiago. Uh, I like the, the, the cigar and the packaging too. So it was good to see Trinidad. Um, kind of come back to life a little in the last year so that's great news to hear it is and you know what that's like that's a brand that has very interesting history yeah because there's not much history to it in terms of like you know from 1920 something it, that doesn't exist but it it's was a newer it's a newer brand and it you know, is but yeah. the history behind it was it was in the 60s and the 70s the 80s 90s whatever it was the cigar that Castro would hand out to dignitaries and diplomats. It was like his special present. Like that was like his blend, his thing. And uh, it became public and available to the public. I'd like to say 1994 at the dinner of a lifetime, it was called or something like that in, in Europe. And, um, you know, a, a brand that has that kind of history that, the main man in Cuba, like that's what he gave as a gift only to important people. Like there's something there that you can play with and kind of honor and, and, you know, respect. So we're definitely taking all that into consideration when it comes to this. You know, so that's fun. And then St. Louis Ray, uh, you, you'll see something come out in uh, 2020. There's a, you know, that brand's a monster. That's kind of like that sleeping monster. I know a lot of guys who go to St. Louis Ray. You know, a lot of smokers will go to that cigar store. It, but that's the thing, though. Like, it sells unbelievable. Um, it's everywhere. People love it. It's it's got loyal fan base. Um, but it's not like one of those cigars where people are like, oh my god, super popular St. Louis. What are you smoking? Oh, I smoke St. Louis Ray. Like, but it, it's like that sleeping giant that's just always there. So. Uh, in true go against the grain fashion, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna put the pedal to the metal uh, in our you know 2020 year, and it's we'll, we'll see something different and aggressive, and uh, put St. Louis Ray back on the map. You know, we have all these fantastic brands, but you know, so earlier talking about the top three brands, but like all these powerful brands need to, they should be on par with these top three. Mm -hmm. And and that's really our goal is to bring them all up there and let people realize like, man, these are all excellent. They all have their own market. You know, we're not going after the same clientele that makes, you know, uh, no sense to cannibalize our other brands, you know? Right. So, it's fun, man. No, Dow's a busy man. I'll tell you that. He's he's hitting that factory hard. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So, Eddie, we want to wrap up with you on what we're smoking. And I want to just mention uh, we're smoking is sponsored by Tailored Smoke, located in the heart of downtown Charlotte's epicenter. Tailored Smoke is your one-stop shop for tailored smoking experience. Aaron, what were you? What did you light up tonight? I am smoking the Henry Clay Warhawk. Yep. 
so this just uh, arrived to me today. Uh, so I lit it up right away. And uh, it's a nice cigar. I mean, it starts out with uh, some toasted wood, a little bit of baking spice to it. Gives that nice little spice to it. Um, as it progresses, get a little bit of earthiness that kind of joins in on that. Um, Retro is pretty nice. I mean, early on, you get a, a little bit more of that spice coming in, but that starts to mellow out as the cigar goes along. Um, but you get a lot of toasted wood, earthiness going on. So it's um, it's not the typical, you're not getting that grassy Connecticut from it or anything like right. that. You're getting more of that fuller bodied, a little bit more strength, but it's not it's not an overpowering strength at all. I'd say it's probably a medium strength cigar. Um, and construction is absolutely fantastic. Sh burns razor sharp. Ash is like inch and a half increments. Um, you know, I don't really have any complaints about the cigar at all. The the bands are fantastic. When I first popped this out of the cello, I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, these these bands are really nice. Like this is another level of bands. It's not just uh, yeah you know, paper bands or anything like that. You got some nice embossing and some nice gold uh, on there. It just the cigar pops. It smokes well. Tastes great. Um, yeah, I mean it's. It's pretty pretty fantastic. Yeah, I nubbed it. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, <laughs> I know I, I literally I know, Eddie. I normally don't like smoking something right off the truck because it's you know it's right off the truck. But uh, I had mine for a couple of days. But I said let me light it up tonight. I think it would be good. Obviously, it's a, a cigar you're talking about, and I wanted to experience it. I agree. I think I, the other thing I'll agree about is. I heard people say this was a mild cigar, and I think some of these people weren't retrohaling it. The retrohale is going to take it more to a medium. You're right. definitely going to get a, a spice on this thing. Um, that uh, It's not a sharp spice, but it's going to put a layer of spice. I kind of felt a little of the Henry Clay feel to this cigar, particularly in the second half. It had a little bit of that ruggedness to it. Right. Um, which I kind of... You know, I kind of said, "Yeah, this is this is different. This is something I could say. It belongs in Henry Clay. It doesn't belong in in, in uh, Monte Cristo." Yeah. So, I, so I kind of did see that differentiator there for sure. Um, so, yeah, and I, like I said, this is a this was a wonderful cigar. Uh, it was very well balanced as well. So, even though you got some of that spice in the retro, there were plenty of other activity going on. Some of the woody notes that Aaron mentioned in there. Um, I didn't get that grassiness. I didn't get any sourness off the cigar either. Mm. Sometimes I get a lot of sourness off of Connecticut when I first light uh, one off the truck. It just seems like so. Uh, this is a r real surprise, uh, folks. I think, uh, and, and Aaron, you mentioned it again the bands. You hold these bands in your hand, you, you know, you feel yeah. the texture of them. They're not paper bands, they're just they're weighty. Uh, they have a beautiful Cuban esque type style to it. Uh, this this is a tremendous this is a tremendous release here. Yep. Uh, don't underestimate this release. Thanks, man. Those uh, I can tell you the entire team will be very happy to hear all that. Yep. No. Uh, yes. This is very good. This is very very good here. So. No, and you know what? The price point, honestly, I I think it's fair. You know, it's, it's pretty good. The Corona, you're looking at seven dollars. Robusto, seven fifty, and the Toro, which you guys are smoking, is eight bucks. Yeah, it's a that's a good value it's for a it. Perfect price. Yeah, I think you got it priced in a good sweet spot too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, I think you can. I think if someone is a Henry Clay smoker and wants to experience a Connecticut side of it, uh, Connecticut shade side of it, this is this is a perfect cigar to do that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and that's the goal. That's the goal, definitely. Yeah. So I think I think you guys have succeeded with that. Awesome. awesome. Super happy to hear that. Awesome. So, Eddie, we're going to do a couple more segments, but you're welcome to stay. If you have to go, that's fine as well. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I do got, got, to, got to wake up a little early, but uh, – No problem, no man. We, we appreciate it. I know we kept you late so here. Uh, there was so much to talk about with this. Uh, so uh, we'll have to definitely get you back. Um, if not, I'll definitely – hopefully I'll see you at the, I'll see you at the trade show for sure. Yeah. But, uh, hope, you know, oh, yeah. Absolutely. We'll, I'm trying, yeah. We'll powwow. Yep. But um, – yeah, great, great to be on the show, and thank you guys for having me. And see you guys in uh, June. Yep, looking forward to a big year from you guys. Yep, oh, that's, yeah. great. that's Eddie Guerra of Alta de USA. Eddie, thank you again. Thank you guys. Have a good one. All right, take care. And uh, what we're gonna do is we will take a uh, quick uh, commercial read, and then we'll get into our next uh, segment here. The authentic Corojo leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful leaves out there. During the golden age of cigars of Cuba, it was the leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. Because it is one of the most challenging ones to cultivate, it fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamasran Valley of Honduras, Julio Aroa took on the challenge of growing Corojo from the original seeds. And in 2000, he reintroduced authentic Corojo back to the market. 
with over 50 years experience in the tobacco business from growing and curing tobacco to cigar production the aroa tobacco farm has been able to deliver products to market with authentic grow now with cherry tobacco julian and son who still bring their very own brand to market each containing the authentic Corojo leaf Tata Scott offers a mild to medium cigar in both Connecticut and Habano wrapper. Rancho Luna is a premium medium cigar that is available in Habano and Maduro. And Aladino is available in a 100% authentic Coro Puro or San Andreas Maduro, representing the golden age of cigars from 1947 to 1961. Now available at your local retailer. Be sure to ask for Jerry Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every drawer. And by Cornelius and Anthony, if you're going to be wanted for something, be wanted for something great. That's what Cornelius Bailey set out to do five generations ago. And that's what Stephen Bailey is doing with Cornelius and Anthony cigars. Using the finest tobaccos, Cornelius and Anthony brings to you Daddy Mac, Venganza, Meridian, Cornelius, Ariel, Senior E-Sugars, and the recently released Jensen Mistress. You can find them at your local tobacconist. And by Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley is a family company. Alan Ruman named the company after his two sons, Alec and Bradley, when they were just little tykes. Now they're all grown up, working alongside their dad, making the best damn cigars you ever smoked. Join the family. Try one today. Learn more at alecbradley.com. By J.C. Newman, be sure to check out the humidor contest to win a Diamond Crown humidor. You can uh, enter the win by going to developingpallets.com or cigar-coop.com. Go in the sidebar. Click, and you can enter to win that humidor. And by Hoya de Nicaragua. Hoya de Nicaragua is celebrating 50 years of operating the oldest cigar factory in Nicaragua and celebrating half a century in the traditions and culture of Nicaragua. And we're going to get into our Debonair Ideal segment, sponsored by Debonair House, makers of Debonair Ultra Premium Cigars and Indian Motorcycle Ultra Premium Cigars. A couple of things about Phil Zengi this week. He, uh, I saw a picture of him with the president of uh, the Dominican Republic. So, uh, and then the other thing is he announced a Indian motorcycle Connecticut shade cigar for Canada. And he's going to have nice. more details on that forthcoming, he told me. So okay. it's going to be a Canadian only release, but, uh, I don't know yet if it's coming to the U S my guess is it probably will at some point, mm-hmm. but we, but we shall see unless, uh, there's some restrictions, I guess, with, with that. So I guess that's something to stay tuned with that on. Uh, but anyway, you know, um, Video games are kind of an interesting thing, and, and uh, I don't know what got me onto the video games, but um, so I kind of asked Aaron, hey, you want to do something on video games? I wasn't sure if Aaron was a video game guy, and Aaron, you kind of came back to me saying, yeah, I kind of was like an 80s guy with it. I, I had some of the old game consoles, yep. and I was like, good, because that's all I can talk <laughs> about, right? <laughs> because I look at what my sons play right now, uh, these Minecraft and stuff, and I have yep. no freaking clue what they're doing, right? Exactly. My youngest son actually is a developer for Minecraft. He actually oh. has a paying gig doing that. My youngest nice. son, Steven, uh, he spends out. Had he spends hours, and uh, the funny thing is, he actually had to upgrade his computer. Mm-hmm. And he goes, "You think I should ask the Minecraft people if they'll pay for it?" I said, "Yeah, absolutely." They probably won't, right? So he, he he wrote him a letter, and they said, "Send us the bill." Nice. So yeah, that's the way it should uh, be. That's the way it should be. Yeah. So, uh, th- there was a that was a, yeah. He was so he worked. It's funny he works on this stuff, and during the show he, he doesn't because we, we, I worry about bandwidth. So uh, right. But yeah, so he but he says it. But but I was kind of again I was kind of the the going back to my history of video games like in the early eighties and you were probably a lot younger but there were like we had three ways we 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 played video games. You mm-hmm. had the game systems like the Ataris, right. the Intelligent, the Odysseys. You had the game computers, which were like the Atari 4 and 800s. Right. And then you had the physical arcade games, right? Yep. Which you'd actually go into the arcade hall, go into a pizza place or a drugstore, and you'd go play the video game. And the thing is, those at the time were the best video games, right? Right. So, and when these new games came out, I remember there would be lines to go play these games, yes. right? And what we used to have to do is the, the kind of – I don't know how the rule is out west, but in, in the east – You'd actually put your quarter on on the on the machine. same out in the west, yep. yep. And that was your like pecking order, and yep. for the most part, people honored it. There's always one jerk who didn't, but but right. yeah, but yeah, that's what we used to do back back then. Um, yeah, and then you'd hope that something would come out on those game systems that would be like comparable, right? <laughs> right, right. But uh, I started out with Atari. I mean, I was I, I should say I started out with Pong. I was a little more of the Pong. I remember when sure. Pong came out was a big deal. But it was really that Atari, uh, they called it the video computer system, which became the 2600. That was the one I had. Right. Yeah. Um, I started out with the Atari 2600. Um, and then Odyssey, I think, followed fairly quickly after that. 
Um, Odyssey was kind of a weird thing. I don't think I ever got any additional games for it other than what I got with it. So it wasn't, it didn't have a long lifespan. Um, but I'd go back to it every once in a while. That I was kind of like me the too. games. Yeah. So. But what but happened, it, yeah, that was like the same thing with me. Yeah. But what happened is the television came out and they had the sports games. Mm-hmm. So they had the best sports games um, to play. Mm-hmm. And if you wanted like a baseball or football game in particular, they were far ahead of what Atari and Odyssey had. Right. Um, we used, there was this um, TV station that used to have this like, uh, they used to put cartoons on in the afternoon. And it was called, uh, they had this little like segment called TV Picks, right? Mm-hmm. Where they basically, they put up an Intellivision game, like they put up the space game, whatever. And you would get to play it over the telephone, right? And the idea okay. is you'd watch it at the same time and you'd say, picks, 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 and they would hit the button. Right. And, it, and you win these great prizes. I actually got on once, right? But it was uh-huh. hard because there's a little bit of a delay. Right. And you have to kind of like do that. So, but yeah, I did this, the space game and I, I won, I won like, uh, I won like tickets to like, uh, I think it was a hockey game, Rangers game or something like that. Right. Uh, but was, there was a grand prize, which was like a ski weekend or something. Right. That's cool. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I did that. But uh, yeah, I was. Uh, did you have the Atari computers at all? No. Okay. So the, the Atari computers were interesting because they they were kind of like a level up from the Atari, and they used mm-hmm. cartridges, right? Right. Um, and they had this thing called an Atari four hundred, <laughs> mm-hmm. which was like I had this membrane keyboard, right? Right. And uh, you, it had one cartridge slot, right? And then they, then they came out with this thing called the eight hundred. Which had a real keyboard and would allow you, but the, it would allow you to hook up a, uh, a floppy disk drive, right? Which was really cool because um, you would uh, you got better games on the floppy disk drives at the time. Sure, yeah. Um, and then someone came out with a pirate system a, a, where you could actually put a cartridge in and, and record what was uh, like it was the two cartridge slot. You could record the cartridges onto the disk. Oh, okay. So it was like a, a pirating system that was legal. You could buy right. it and do it. So, nice. so we would, uh, you know, then we'd have these big game swaps to do those types of things. Which yeah. Probably, you know, I hope, uh, yeah, that's what we used to do. Nice. So what were some some of your favorite Atari games, like 2600 console games? Well, it was definitely, I think Adventure was that one. And right. Adventure was kind of interesting because the yeah. game itself was good, but it, the whole story of that game became the Easter egg that was in there. Right. Where you'd kind of have to find these hidden things in there, and that that became more popular than winning the game of adventure itself. Right. Yeah, I think um, some of the core games that I enjoyed on Atari was uh, Pitfall. That was the um, Activision series. Yeah, and then uh, obviously Pac Man was on Atari. That um, was, oh, that was a disaster though. <laughs> and then uh, I know that this was kind of. Di- this is kind of labeled as the death of Atari, but the the ET game. Did you ever get to play the ET I, game? I had it. I had it. it yeah, was, I thought it was a good game. I, I don't know why it was people. A bad game. I didn't think it was yeah. terrible. Um, but then with with the Atari, you had you had the the spinning controller, right? Yep. So you could do that with Pong or Breakout. Yep. Um, and then there was other games that you could do that on. Um, what was the there was a. I can't remember. There was a game that had like a bunch of different games in it. So you had like the tanks, you had the worm game, you had uh, all those kinds of games are in there. Um, and the. It was, the like, it was like a game pack. Yeah, the planes, where you had like the one small plane and the one huge plane. Um, so that was interesting. Um, I have the list up of games here and I'm, I can't find the name of that game. Yeah, and there was another game that was almost like a an asteroids type, not asteroids type game, almost like a. Gosh, I'm not bring, forgetting the name of it. Um, it was you know it had all the all the bad things at the top of the screen, and it kind of came down at you, and you were moving at the bottom and shooting at. But I don't. It was like Mega Mania or something like that. I don't know if that. Phoenix, it wasn't Phoenix though. I don't know. It wasn't Phoenix. I want to say it was Mega Mania or something like that. Um. But that was interesting. Um, they had some decent sport games. There was a good tennis game on there. Yeah, they um, had a real sports tennis. Mm-hmm. They had. Um, they had a good Raiders of the North Stock was a pretty good game. Yeah, that was a good game. 
That was a that was a that was a good one. Um, you know the the Space Invaders they did wasn't bad. Right. Yeah. This game it I was, was talking about was similar to Space Invaders. That was the one I was looking for. It was okay. similar to that, but it was a little it was a little bit different. Yeah, and uh, I know what you're talking about. And the game's escaping me. And then uh, I think the game was called Command, where it had like the stars that would shoot down like the lines down to the bottom and try to hit you. Um, and then Centipede was on there, right? And Centipede, and then they came out with Millipede on there as well. Yep, Millipede. Um, Defender. Bring, the, the Defender was a... Uh, Defender, yeah. This is bringing me back to some yeah. a lot of games, man. Holy smokes. What they used to do is they used to put, like, with those packs, they'd put a lot of games on there. Yeah. And then they kind of figured out that if they put one really good game on there, they can maximize the memory. So some of the quality of the games got better with that. Mm-hmm. Um, the Missile Command version that they came out with was really good too. Missile Command, that's what it was. It wasn't just Command. Missile, Missile Command. Command, yeah, that was it. That's Command. the one. Yeah. Yeah. That was the one. Yeah, okay. I had part of the name right. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, they uh, the that was a good one. Um, Night Driver. Night Driver. Yep. Night Driver. You yeah. Uh, that was based off an arcade <sighs> game. Now I got to look up this list of Atari games, man. I got me th- got me thinking because I know there's a ton that I played that I'm, uh forgetting about they uh no they had, there was a few of them there was uh they had the um i mentioned um dig uh, dig dug was another one dig dug yep circus atari right circus atari was pretty good it had like uh it had the seesaw and you'd have these balloons and you kind of have to kind of put the balloons on your hat head and stuff like that right yeah you have these rows of balloons that would come down and then it would just get compl- it was that was another one based off in a uh a uh a game as well yeah um they had you know what they had uh they had this one cartridge called uh the game called basic programming I don't so know, if you I actually wanted to pro- yeah you had to get the keyboard for that though okay but you could but you could actually write uh very simple basic which is a, a program which was like a programming language right uh it was like but uh you'd actually be able to do some some rudimentary things so if you were just trying to like learn programming right it wasn't a bad thing like for 30 bucks you can kind of do some very rudimentary programming on there. Right. Berserk. Berserk was another one. Yeah. Uh, uh, Berserk was, Berserk was, uh, you know, you, then you'd have that one, like you, you'd shoot those guys and then that happy guy would come over and basically like kind of try to kill you. Right. Uh, let's see what else. Haunted house was a good one. I don't remember that one. It was kind of a, uh, another version of, um, you kind of had to go and you had to recover these like urns mm-hmm. and it was kind of like, it had a little bit of that adventure feel to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was a, there was a racing game where you could do the, the ice track. Yes. And you could slide around that. That was, that was pretty cool. And that was, you'd use the, you'd use the circular the, controller for that one. Yeah. Um, was it the racing pack? I don't know. There was, they, pole, have, they had a pole position, but it wasn't in pole position. Yeah, they had an Indy 500 game. I don't think it was that one. Maybe it was that one. Uh, did you ever do a uh, Math Grand Prix? Yes. The dragster one. Is that yeah. the dragster one? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That I was pretty cool. Yeah, that was a uh, that was another one that was uh, really cool. That uh, came out a little later, I remember. Yeah. Uh, they had a fellow on there. Yep. Which was uh, the board, board game. Yes, they had a fellow. Um, they had um. I mentioned the real sports stuff, which was kind of like a second iteration of um, sports games they did to mm-hmm. kind of try to make it a little uh, better. That's when they, if when they, that's when they became like twenty six hundred and they changed the box style a bit to right. the silver boxes. They they improved all this because Coleco was killing them in the sports department. Is what yeah. happened. So they kind of redid all their sports games with that mm-hmm. and surround. Surround. I'm that was the one where you were like, ma- you were making the lines as that little dot, and you were trying to enclose the other person. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I remember that. Yeah, it had these like, they looked like almost like Tetris type things. They were mm-hmm. at the time. It mm-hmm. wasn't Tetris though. Right. That that was a really good one. Uh, video pinball. Yep. Video pinball was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, that was actually. I don't know if people know. Video pinball was a, was a standalone console game for a long time. Okay. And then they moved it into, uh, then they moved it into the Atari series, from what I remember. Right. 
Uh, and you literally, it was a, it was a video version of pinball, uh, which yeah. wasn't that bad. Yeah. Well, yeah, the other one, uh, some of the other, the Activision games I thought were pretty cool. The, the, the skiing game was fantastic. The right. The slalom game. Yep. Yep. What was funny was my, my grandfather, my mom's father, he was into Atari. Um, and he had built this whole big console box where he had the Atari. He had like a, a lift up lid on the top where he had all the games in there. And then he had a door on the front where the Atari was in there and then all the different controllers and stuff like that. And I would love going over to my grandfather's house because we get to play Atari with him. And he was totally into it. Um, I just thought it was a cool thing to do with him. Oh, yeah. It was, um, you know, we had uh, my buddy's, uh, my buddy Michael. He was my best man at my wedding. Um, his uncle worked for RCA. Mm-hmm. He was very technical. So he loved all the video games, too. And, you know, we, we uh, you know, he's like this you know 50 year old guy at the time. And he was, uh, you know, playing all these games. He just he just was really digging it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was pretty. That was another pretty cool one. There was um, there was something that they came out with under Activision. A game. It was kind of like this jungle game. Mm. Boy, I can't remember the name of it now. It was kind of like it wasn't Raiders of the Lost Ark, but it was kind of. You're like not thinking about Pitfall. It was Pitfall. Yeah, that's what you. Yeah, yeah. You already mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. I mean, you jumped over the on the heads of the alligators. You swung from the vines. Yeah. You had to go underground. It was it was pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. Then they had Kaboom, which was the one where the bombs were dropped. Use the. Uh, Paddle controls with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was a pretty cool one as well. Like I said, I remember when the Activision games came out, those were like the, the first of the third-party games that came out. That was pretty cool what they did with that. Mm-hmm. Um, how about, did you ever play any, um, I'm trying to think what else. Did you ever play any, were you in, into the uh, art, games in the arcades at all? Yes. Do you remember a game, this came out, like I want to say it was 84 called champion baseball does not ring a bell oh this was like the best baseball game that was out there uh-huh. it, was, it, it had to be like the number one game of, like of the year in 84 85 it was literally you play baseball but it was one of the best simulation of baseball it was like by today's standards it's it's very rudimentary right but uh it was an awesome game and it had a you know you could pick teams that you wanted so like, you could pick like even though they weren't major league players it, you, i think you, you know they had like major league like looks to them Right. Yeah, they just had to use. They didn't have a license, because they had to use different names, but they could get the likenesses to be similar. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it was. I think it was a game that originated in. Um, I just looked it up. Yeah, it originated in Japan, but they had like they had several. You could you could pick like from several teams that you had, and then it would wear mm-hmm. the caps and the uniforms with that as well. Right. Yep. Uh, and it said eighty three on here. Yeah. Did you ever play another game, Dragon's Lair? That's I was gonna bring that up. That was like a that was like a completely changing of the whole era of games because it was cartoon. It was a cartoon, right? Style thing. It was not the gra- It was not computer graphics, and it was just amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. I just I like that was one. That was one game. Well, there was many games, but that was like one game where you could just like watch and like enjoy what was going on. It was. I remember you wanted to play that game because it was a longer game you would play. Mm-hmm. And you would some if you wanted to play that game, you could sometimes have a two hour wait mm-hmm. with that game. So you'd watch it a lot. And it, like I said, it was um it was, you know, it was kind of cool as far as uh like I said, it used uh, it used that laser technology. It was something technology wise it used very different that, yep. that we had seen before. Yeah. I I heard someone also say that Mrs. Pac-Man actually was more successful than Pac-Man. I think I heard that as well. Yeah, someone said it because they made so many more machines of it. Right. So it, it took in more money. I think Pac-Man may have had a higher average per machine. Right. But Mrs. Pac-Man, because they made so many of them, it mm-hmm. was it was much bigger. Right. So what were the what were some of the top arcade games for you? Um. So definitely. I love Phoenix. Uh huh. That was the one where you, you kind of it was kind of you're at the bottom and you kind of you kind of had the idea was you, you plowed through uh you, you plowed through several um rounds of like shooting these birds and these right. birds would split these eggs would come down and then the final one you would get to would be um the um 
this ship and you'd have to try to blow the ship up at the end. Right. So, yeah, and they had, it, it was it was a pretty challenging game. I liked the sequel to Galaxian, which was Galaga. Right. Yep. Which was a little more, it, it kind of enhanced the whole Gal- 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 Galaxian was more of a straight shoot the things and Galaga had a little more, uh, a little more strategy you had to put with it. Um, it was a little more sophisticated as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that was another one. I mentioned champion baseball was a, was a big one. Uh, kicks. Did you ever play kicks? kicks? No. Q I X. Okay. It was this thing where you had to kind of, um, try to, what's the word you had to kind of try to, it was a surround type strategy game. Mm-hmm. And what you would do is you would, um, you try to build these rectangles and kind of, uh, try to enclose in this, like, what well, what's the word it's kind of like this um they had kind of this thing that moved around uh-huh. <laughs> uh it was i don't know how to explain it but it was like this wave that would move around but you build the you try to capture area and try okay. to basically you know surround the idea is you would surround this this moving thing and the more area you enclose the more you would make on it right and it would get harder and harder because you had to claim in order to get to the next level, you had to get 75% of claim 75% of the area. So you build these rectangles. But what right. happens if you hit into the this moving wave that mm-hmm. was kind of you 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 were done, you you lose. So the idea is you just got to keep trying to build rectangles without this thing kind of hitting it. So the strategy is you build you can build a lot of small ones and not get hit. Right. Um, or you try to build a big one and hope you can capture some area quickly, but as the area got smaller. This this wave there was less area for the wave to move around, so it was tougher to kind of claim that seventy five percent. Sure, yeah. Um, so that that was definitely a that was a pretty big hit, at least when I was uh, growing up as well. Right. Uh, yeah, there's a few for me. Um, one of the early ons was Cubert. Yes. So that was all the what was it hexagons or whatever that you were hopping yep. up on the things to get through those. Um, did you ever play Gauntlet? Yeah, I played Gauntlet as well. So that was one of those games where you could, I think you could have four people Mm -hmm. as different characters and you could uh, all kind of work together as a team to get through these different stages and stuff like that. Um, How about Shinobi? I don't remember Shinobi. Shinobi was like a ninja game. So you're kind of like going through levels like from left to right kind of thing, just working through stuff. That was pretty cool. Um uh 1942 the that game. the airplane yeah. game yeah the airplane game yeah you go through different areas of time mm-hmm. that was a really good one as well um and i think one of the one of the biggest games was street fighter yes i remember that one and then that led into mortal Kombat kind yes. of thing um joust think, you ever do joust joust yep that was yep, another joust. one Joust when you were on the, the birds. Yep. 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 And you joust. Uh, track and field. Yep. Where you, uh, people were coming up with contraptions to try to run faster. Did you ever see anybody bring out a, a contraption to the arcade? No, I did not. So I, you know, there were people that were bringing out these things that were these motors that would have like uh, toothbrush stems on it to like try to, you had the two buttons that you had to do to run and they would bring those out to try to make it, see if they could go as fast as they could. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so that was pretty interesting. But one of my favorite games, um, was, uh, Ivan Stewart, uh, like dirt truck racing. Oh yeah. So you had like all these different tracks and you had the nitro button to speed up and stuff like that. And you were running through there and you could build up your car and your truck to, you know, add tires or shocks or an engine or more nitro and all that kind of stuff. That was pretty fun. We mentioned pole position earlier on. Yep. Pole that position. Was a, that was a really cool one. Uh, that was, yep. that was in a sit down console mm-hmm. uh, available. I think it was available in both actually. And there was another, there was another driving game. I want to, I don't remember if it was called Drive or Driver, maybe, but it was a uh, you had the option to go automatic or manual. Manual, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the the steering wheel would and the seat would move. At, you know, if you went off the road, things like that would happen. That was pretty cool. Um, Were you ever into like the what I would call there was like um 
you know, first it was like Space Invaders, then it was Asteroids and Asteroids mm-hmm. Deluxe, which uh, then they came up with Pac Man and then Donkey right. Kong. We ever Donkey there? Kong, yeah. Donkey Kong was a big game, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Donkey Kong kind of created the whole Mario Brothers thing, but mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, the, the the cool thing was um, the uh, then they came out with what was it, Donkey Kong Junior? Right. That was actually I liked that one a lot. Yeah. That was one where they, uh, yeah, that was uh, kind of they reversed the roles where Mario was the bad guy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that that was a that was a good one. Um, you know, the whole thing with, with Pac Man was you try to get that was kind of the first game where you, the idea is you try to get up to those higher levels. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it was like you go from like, you know, you'd start out with like, what was the first uh, cherries. And you move your way up to things like pears and oranges, right. apples, and then you get to the keys, which were like the uh, the key thing. You know that was that was like the mm-hmm. highest level, and, right. was, and the game would really speed up as you go along with that. Yep. Um. So th- those were those were big as well. Yeah. Were you ever? Did you get into kind of the Nintendo at all? Yeah, I got into Nintendo and Sega, and that was the that was the end. Those were the ends for me. Once I got past. A thumb pad and two buttons, or however many buttons was on the Sega. I don't know I was, if the Sega had three. Yeah. I was I was done. I I just my I couldn't ever get beyond that. Like Super Nintendo was kind of too much for me. Oh yeah, it was. Uh, you know, I I you know the, the game system I really liked, and I invested in it. And I was by by this time I was at college, right? That ColecoVision. Mm-hmm. What a boss that turned out to be. Yeah. Uh, Cole- we have, there was so much promise with that system, and then Coleco as a company just like screwed up. They tried to come out with that Atom computer, and right. uh, the games were really good. They didn't season come out with a lot, but everyone thought Coleco Vision was gonna like wipe wipe the planet off with everything else. Right. Uh, but I'll tell you what, with the Nintendo, it was no doubt Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Uh, that was I your would, favorite Nintendo game? Oh, without I mean, my I, by the time Mike Tyson's Punch Out came out, I was already dating my wife. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so. She says, well, you know, we're like seniors in college, right? She says, what do you, like, what do you want for Christmas? I go, uh, I go, uh, I go, I want a Nintendo. She's like, you ain't getting a Nintendo, right? Well, my dad bought it for me. Nice. <laughs> she went by for me. My dad bought it for me, right? Right. Who do you think was the one who started playing the, uh, uh-huh. the, the Nintendo? Yeah. My wife. Okay. <laughs> who... I still have the console in my house. I don't think it works anymore. But right. I still have, but she was playing, and then I ended. I, like, it was after Mike Tyson's punch out, like I said, and then these things started getting the Sega Genesis and stuff. I just at that point it was it got too complicated for yeah. me as well. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but but that was a cool thing because the idea was you wanted to try to get to the Mike Tyson. Uh, right. Punch out was an arcade game for a long yeah. time, but they but Tyson, I guess. Uh, you know, launched it. Uh, Punch Out was a fun game in the arcade to play. It was a little different uh, playing it at home, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was that was mine. My favorite Nintendo game was uh, Baseball Stars. That was a good game. And that the the reason I loved it so much was because you could create your own team, you could name your players, you could build multiple teams, and you could trade players between the teams. And then as you won games, you could power up your players. Uh, and you could save all that stuff so that you can continue playing like a season and all that stuff. So it was just really like it was an advancement. And that's kind of what got me uh, kind of into like fantasy baseball and stuff, being able to keep track of stats and all that kind of stuff. That was like the the genesis for me in making that happen. Oh, yeah, that was that was great. That was great as well. I, I agree with that. Yeah, it was it was a. Uh... That was a good game. I, I forgot about that game actually. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, my wife got into like the Super Mario Brothers and stuff like that. And Tech Mobile, then, you got it. Can't forget Tech Mobile. Tech Mobile was great. Yeah. Tech Mobile was awesome. Tech, like I said, that was I think that was a, I was in college when Tech Mobile came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was another one. Yeah, that was really good. That was another one I really enjoyed as well. The kind of what happened in the. 90s right so i ended up having you know i have my daughter's born and then my boys start getting born the did you you know about the whole mame emulator no uh-uh. so by like let's go back like by 1999 someone an open source project took a lot of these games 
and moved them to a point where they built an emulator for mm. your Windows machines and right. Apple machines, uh, where you could play these games. They actually took the, they actually transformed the ROMs from the arcade machines, right, uh, and the game systems, uh, and you're able to play them. And you could, you could download. It's called M A M E, M A M E, yeah, for free. Uh, in fact, it's even on the uh, Internet Archive as well. But you can get these, and you get an emulator for your computer. Uh, the tricky part is you have to configure some of the keys, right? But it isn't really that hard. And and so my boys, that's how they got into video games because I started like re- getting back into these old games and revisiting yep. them with the name. They started playing it, and the rest. Then they ended up going to the next generation, obviously. But yeah, but it was kind of cool to see that. Um, yeah. Oh, Tron. Did you ever play Tron? Uh, I played it a little bit. Um, I don't know. I don't know the reason why I didn't get really into it. The game, the game was okay. It wasn't yeah. a great game. It was a thing, but that yeah. they came out that movie at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we, they had a video game convention come to New Jersey when I was living there, and my son Timmy and I went there, and uh, we met Lacey Underall from from uh, from Caddyshack, who was in Tron. Right. So I ended up talking Caddyshack with her the whole time, like basically. Nice. But she was really nice. And then my wife's there, and she's talking about some soap opera she was in, and it was yeah. But it was it was kind of cool. She was super nice. I have a picture somewhere of us with her. Right. Um. Yeah. But she was in Tron, uh, and she was very high on that experience with that movie too. She nice. said it was a, because that was a was it Jeff Bridges in there? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they did a remake of it, right? They did a remake of it. I yeah. didn't see it though. I got. I didn't honest. see it either. But yeah, the movie was actually the movie was pretty good, but the game was sucked actually, from what I remember. Yeah, it went to the arcades and then it went to video, and it was it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. So yeah, it was. Uh, but yeah, I couldn't tell you much about the newer games today, unfortunately. Nope. We I did just have didn't. we did have a pinball machine growing up in the house. Oh wow! My dad, my dad bought the uh, the Elton John pinball machine, okay. Captain Fantastic. He got a hell of a deal on it. Uh, we played that thing for about 10 years. People would always come up to my house. They'd want to play it. Right. Um, long story short, my parents got divorced, okay? Mm-hmm. And when my parents got divorced, uh, my dad moved some. My dad moved into an apartment, and he could not keep the pinball machine. Mm-hmm. And he wanted me to buy it, right? And I'm like, <laughs> and I st- well, not buy it. He was going to give it to me, right? Right. But at the time, I was in a condo. I didn't have the room for it, right? Yeah. So he sold the thing, right? Yeah. Except he found out that, that he basically got rooked. This thing had so much. We didn't know the value of this thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, because this particular pinball machine was just a classic. Yeah. And it was, I mean, he got, he got a, maybe he got a couple thousand, but I'm thinking this thing was worth, he probably got like one fifth of what it was worth. Right. I heard. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it was unfortunate. Yeah. It was actually a real cool. And it had the old digital, not digital, it had the old, analog dials um, right the, and and at the time when, we, when he bought the machine the guy there was a pinball store and a pool table store and the guy said don't buy the digital because it's going to cost you a fortune to maintain it right um and i can i learned how to like i'm not mechanical but i had i remember i used to change the bumper you'd have to change the bumpers put different rubbers in those right yeah yep. uh it, that was pretty much all you had to do with it at the time uh yeah occasionally a circuit blew out and you had to get someone in there but that was it was good yeah yeah it used Did real quarters yeah did you ever play pachinko? Yes. Yeah, we when I, growing up, my uh, my oh, dad's yeah. parents had I'd say maybe like six pachinko machines, and we man, we would go to town on those machines. Holy smokes, remember, that was fun. Did you have like the real old style ones of those? Yeah, it was the ones that mechanical. had like the yeah, like the like almost like the door handle levers, yes, and stuff like that. And you you know you'd get the payout at the bottom of all the balls and all that stuff. Yeah, it was kind of a combination of like a slot machine and a pinball machine, is what yep, I remember. Yeah, exactly. And the trick was is you know if you still had the good ones that you could get, and you could still plug them in, and the lights would still work and stuff like that. That was all. That was all fun. Yeah, yeah, and it was very Japanese style. I mean, you looked at yep. this thing; it was it was. It looked like something right out of a Japanese store for sure. Yeah, the balls had little Japanese characters on them. Yeah, exactly. What they said, you know, whatever. So, but it was, yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that one a lot too. I enjoyed that one a lot too. It was uh, one of my, like I said, I didn't have a machine, but I knew people who did have it. Yeah. yeah. So, anything else on video games? I don't think so. I mean, I never, I never, I didn't get that really into any computer games. Yeah, you know. I mean, there were for a while. I was into a few of them. Um, 
But, uh, yeah, I mean, they had a uh, micro league baseball was another good one. I would say right. that was the first one where you could actually take real teams and, and, and simulate them. Um, there is, did you ever do, I mean, do you ever do, you didn't do Stratomatic at all, right? I didn't do Stratomatic. Um, I did play another game. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. It's still active. They come out with a new version every year. Out of, out of, out of the park. Out of, I, yeah, that's I, I used it. To do, I used to do leagues with that. Man, that was, and that, it just kept getting so advanced and advanced. Like you were like every, you know, general manager, every level, you know. It was hard to build. Yeah. I mean, there were guys who, let me tell you something. There were, I, I think I know baseball, but there were guys that would just, just, I mean, they would just, they knew the ins and outs of this game. Yeah. And yep. they still come out with it every year. Yep. Yeah. There was a, I used to, there was a guy who used to run a website and uh, basically all you had to do was uh, buy the, buy the game and you just upload your file to him every week. Right. Uh, yeah. So I had the, uh, I had the Las Vegas Expos was my team there. Okay. Uh, and I played in the old Jerry Park in Montreal though, but it was, yep. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, but yeah, it was, uh, and it had players, but yeah, it got really, it's still out there. You can yep. still get it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's super like it's super in depth now. Like you know, you have to deal with arbitration, all that kind of stuff is in there, man. It's, yeah, it's exactly like real baseball. Yeah, it's not a video game. It's a, sim it's a simulator game, yeah. is what I would say. Yep, yep. Uh, I mean, you could just run the simulations and watch them if you're that interested. But it's, but the idea is when you get the people playing competitively. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the people are people are in leagues where they have their teams and they're doing the do. yeah. entire thing. Yeah, so it's it's super involved. And the stats, the stats, this thing would crank out every baseball stat you wanted. Yep. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And it was tough. I mean, I had some, I had, I had a couple hundred lost team, like my, my <laughs> Marlin type seasons. Yeah. And one year, one year I got over 500. It was like, it was tough. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. That's our video game look back uh, into yesteryear here. Uh, let's get into our final segment. Um, Sponsored by Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. With Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Master Blender Steve Saka set out to create pro, uh, pro, let's start that again. With Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Master Blender Steve Saka set out to create Puro Son Compromiso, cigars without compromise. This represents an expression of Saka's closely held values and attests in three simple words everything wants to Saka wants to accomplish. Cigars are more than a passion of Saka, they're a way of life. As for the brands of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Sobra Mesa, Mi Curita, Umbagag, Moesta de Saca, Todos Los Dias, and the recently seen Compromiso, Yolka Tobacconist. And by M. Bombay Cigars. M. Bombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best of the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay Cigars are enrolled in Costa Rica by some of the world's most experienced cigar rolls, giving it a unique smoking experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try M. Bombay and the Gaia line, as well as the recently released M. Cuba line. M. Bombay Cigars, where the cigar is a way of life. And by Caldwell Cigar Company. Caldwell Cigar Company launched in 2014 with a very simple mantra, create, innovate, ambition. Since day one, they have done things differently. They have challenged the industry norms to produce sticks that time and time again deliver on that promise. Look for Caldwell products or any number of their collaborations at your local retailer today. And by Casa Cuevas Cigars. The Cuevas family has four generations of experience in cigar making. For many years, they have manufactured cigars for many industry leaders out of there. Las Lavas Factory in the Dominican Republic. Now, the Cuevas family is bringing their very own brand to market with Casa Cuevas Cigars. Try the Casa Cuevas Connecticut, the Casa Cuevas Habano, and the Casa Cuevas Maduro, as well as the recently released Prensado and limited edition Flaco line extensions. If they don't carry it, be sure to ask your local retailer for Casa Cuevas Cigars. Casa Cuevas Cigars from our casa to yours. Uh, just a quick note um, on the meat road. Uh, I'm going to be heading up to Pittsburgh tomorrow <laughs> uh, afternoon. Um, and uh, I'm going to be spending some time with Island Jim. Um, nice. So my goal is I'll take some Cattle Baron cigars. I'll probably have some Island Jim cigars. But I, I'm making – I've never been to Permantis. Uh, I'm going to go there this weekend. So just when – I was in Florida a couple weeks ago. Uh -huh. and I just learned of a – of the Pittsburgh style way to cook steak. I had never heard of that. Oh, before. Pittsburgh rare. Yeah. Oh, so char my charred like crazy on the outside, no, raw on the inside, pretty much. And right? I'm not a rare guy, but I love that. Interesting. I, I hadn't ever known that was a, a, a named style. I, I used to date this girl who worked at the sizzler, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, and, um, she was actually much older than me. That's another story. But, um, <laughs> 
<laughs> next but, week, uh, put it on the put it on the agenda for next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I used to go in there like she was working the register at Sizzle, and I'd wait for her to get off work. And and some guy, I remember some guy came in and asked for a Pittsburgh rare steak at Sizzler. Uh -huh. and she had no freaking clue. I had never heard of this either. Yeah. And then he explained it, and I heard, and I'm like, wow. And then um, so I had heard of it for a long time actually. Uh, it, yeah. it actually, it's it, it's very hard to do it, by the way. Right. Uh. If you're doing a steak, it's very hard to do it. I've tried to do it. It's tough. I think you have to start with a pretty thick cut. You got to have a thick cut. And you got to have a good flame, but you got to be careful not to overchar it. Mm -hmm. Because you can overchar it. So, uh, but yeah, no, I've had it. Uh, it's very good. Yeah. It's the only way I say, yeah. So, I don't know. I can't have any, like, I'm going to be getting up there late tomorrow night. So, probably Saturday or Sunday. Right. For sure, yeah. Well, I'll have to check that out. Uh, uh, Nick Sirius is supposed to be joining me too there. So nice. Uh, so we'll be in, yeah, you see, we're doing a we're gonna do a little piece on Island Gym. So cool. Uh, uh, more of a written piece. So stay tuned on that. I don't know how that's gonna go. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> that could be very unpredictable. So uh, we'll check that out. A uh, couple of industry topics. Um, I wanted to kind of round out the show with this week. Um, and these kind of both came. You know, I think we've mentioned we have this like. Uh, group chat going on yep. and there's all sorts of like stuff that goes on in this group chat right and there were a couple of things that came up that i thought was interesting right and raised a few questions right um the first one is that starkey arius mm -hmm. who folks may know from cigar rings and um most recently he said some time as aj fernandez's uh marketing director Mm -hmm. He did a lot of the art stuff with them. He's kind of ventured out on his own. He's doing his own thing now. And he's forming this B2B system called Cigar Marketplace, uh, which yeah. is really – it's really going to be a way for retailers to order cigars, uh, you know, without having to wait for the rep to come. Yep. Um, he's not the first guy to do this. I, I've seen other companies start to do this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the interesting thing is – he even said it in his press release that this wasn't meant to be a substitute for the for the cigar rep. Right. My question is, is this really a tool that will work for – is this something that you think could work? Because this – I have a few thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. I like the concept of having a B2B system. Right. But this industry is very old school. Yeah. They, you know, I don't know. I just think – I, I think in, a, in, a, in this business, right, and I'll get your thoughts on it, when you're competing for shelf space and you don't have a rep in present, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if the rep will give you the opportunity to order the cigar. Hey, just click it in your order. The rep's got to be there. Right. I mean, it is, it's the rep's job to sell cigars. Yeah. And that doesn't just mean sell it to the store. That means sell it through the store. So that they're reordering. Right. Right. So, you know, if they're able to um, carve out a presence in there with the regulars and things like that, so they can continually push those cigars to sell, that's a benefit to the store and the brand and the rep themselves. Right. But we see a lot of these reps, they have huge territories. Mm -hmm. And I know, for example, like in Charlotte, right? And California, I think it's its own animal too, but mm -hmm. Charlotte competes. Charlotte is not a big cigar market in terms of the amount of stores. Right. right. There's Atlanta has a huge amount of stores and Virginia has a huge amount of stores. And unless the company is a big enough company to have a Carolina rep, mm -hmm. we're t we tend to share the rep with either Atlanta or Virginia. And right. those brands that do that, it just is not, they do not do well. And even if yeah. you pop into a Charlotte store, Chances are they don't last there very long. Right. So yeah. I don't know how this would solve that problem in that case. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see it for those areas that don't get a, you know, a continuous rep presence, um, or maybe they just don't like the rep. Uh, they could place their orders that way. Um, the thing with that, though, is if, you know, you're, if that's kind of your main contact with the company, uh, your chance of getting an event with that brand may be lower unless you're selling a lot, regardless of how you're selling it, you know, then they may make the effort to, you know, have a presence there for events and things like that. Yeah, that's true. You know, um, 
you make a good point with that. You know, and sometimes, like I said, an event will be the driver with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know, it, it sometimes will boost the brand. Other times, it won't. Yeah, I mean, rep turnover is what I've seen with rep turnover in our area. It's amazing. A rep could change tomorrow, and a mm-hmm. brand can disappear from the shelves. Right. Yeah, because it's you know a lot of times it's it's uh, rep loyalty rather than brand loyalty. So if a rep goes to a different company, those are the cigars that the store is buying, rather than you know they were buying this brand. The rep left. Now the rep's gonna have a hard time getting his new brand into the store. You know, I don't think that's the case most of the time. Yeah, and I mentioned that Charlotte's also has another factor is that consumers in the Charlotte area are very store loyal. Mm-hmm. So guess what? If you're if, if the cigar disappears from the store, even if the cigar is available across town, someone's buying a new brand in there. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that's just that's just how I've seen it. It is right. no I've never seen maybe there's a few people that, oh, they're not carrying this anymore. I'll switch stores. But that doesn't happen because there's so many choices out there that they'll come back and just buy. OK, there's something else in there in that humidor that they'll have. That they'll be able to find right yeah and there's some brand you know there's brands that have their own portals and i can see where that makes sense because that brand may not have have representation in certain areas and that's kind of the way that those shops would be able to access the brand um, but kind of on a broader level where you're representing multiple brands through the portal you know and i don't I think know that's, if that I think works that's, and i think that's what starkey's trying to do here right um but you mentioned that dion's kind of doing that yep Exactly, but, but here's what Dion's done in the last year. He's hired a brand ambassador, and I think he's hired yep. a couple. So now he's kind of okay. Maybe this guy's not going to be the rep per se. He's going to have more of an ambassador. Okay, goodwill visit the store role and yep. run the event kind of deal. Yeah, uh, and then he'll work with maybe you know Dion's got a, Dion's invested a lot in his B two B system from what I've mm-hmm. seen. Mm-hmm. Um, so it seems you know. So I think Starkey's doing something very similar to that. Yeah. He hasn't rolled out the details of what he's doing yet, so I think. He's just announced it, and he's he's got some more announcements. He told me, and he's going to be at the show this year, which is going to be interesting. Yeah, uh, I'm curious. I mean, I I would guess he's going to target mid mid sized companies with that. Sure. I don't see him. I don't see like a very small boutiqueish brand that working. Uh, obviously, the big companies have a full sales force. I don't see that working either. Right. It could be somewhere in between with that. Yeah. Like I could see, like maybe a Kristoff type size company. I'm, you know, I know they have their own field reps, but something along that right. size company. Yep. Uh, where I, I could see that happening. Yeah, I mean, there's a chance that it could take off. I mean, um, as you said, it's you know kind of an old school industry, so you know maybe the shop owners that kind of are in that older age range, they'll still like that kind of human interaction. But there may be some of those uh, that have uh, a little bit of a younger ownership level or whoever's managing the store and doing the purchasing, you know, they may fa- find that, you know, I think the younger you get for people, uh, the less human interaction necess- that they may be interested in. So if they can handle everything, you know, through a single portal to make a bunch of purchases, there's a potential for that, that that could actually be beneficial. So uh, I'll just be interested. I don't, I don't know enough of the rest of the country in regards to how the shops run to know to know one way or the other how that would shake out yet yeah i agree i'm not sure either how that would either um that's a good that's a very good question a point you raised there and also i mean a lot of it depends on who you're who you're representing as well so what brands you have in you know that you can distribute um is a big deal i mean if you have a, a real small offering it may not take off unless you're starting to build it quickly you know, if yeah. you only have five brands or whatever it is, depending on, and also depending on who those brands are, you know, that can make or break the, the whole gig. Very true. Very true. So I think it's something to worth watch, at least with this right now mm-hmm. um, to see. I mean, I think there is some changes going on. I think, I think a lot of people realize at the same time, I, I give Starkey some credit because I think the, the current model, particularly with the brokers, doesn't work very effectively. Mm-hmm. It's very hard for... Have you seen, like, here's my question. Have you seen, I've seen a few brands that have graduated from the broker model to 
an in-house model successfully, but there are very few of them. Have you seen any? Like, I don't think I don't think I have any that come to mind. Um... I mean, the closest. I mean, I was going to say my father, but they still have some brokers. Right. So. I mean, California is a very broker-driven state. Yeah, um, it's completely different out there too. Yeah, so it's kind of how most of it is driven out here. And why is that? Um, is it just because it's far further out? It, I think it's the way the laws work in the in the state in regards to the ta- tobacco licenses and and how you can sell and things like that. Yeah, I mean there are there you know there are reps out here, um, but uh, especially as how the taxes have been changing and things like that, it makes it tougher for the reps if they're especially if they're representing a single brand. Uh, makes it real tough. So you see some of the reps that they start to kind of expand out. So they have to represent multiple brands to be able to kind of keep that volume up. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. I mean, um, but now that I think about it yet, yeah, the, that's what I've seen out there. That's mm-hmm. true. It's, it's, uh, that is true. The, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I was, I was thinking of La Polina, but I don't think La Polina I could get called out as success. Right. I, you know, I just, I just haven't, not that I just think I think maybe it will get there. I think Kristoff's done a reasonably good job with that though. They right. have they have converted it. Um uh but I think that brand still has a lot more to grow in right now too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's go to our second topic here. Anything else on that? No, let's go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, I was going through I was last week I was uh I was I was traveling, so I started the announcement came out about the whole FDA um, substantial equivalence thing, right? Mm-hmm. So I was flying back on, I was at the airport on Saturday. I read through the whole FDA thing, right? And it was it was kind of interesting because I, when I started reading it, they started talking about the whole concept of substantial equivalence, proving something was substantial equivalent to a commercially marketed product. Mm-hmm. And in there, and this was not new news, but it was kind of brought to light for me is that the FDA is looking very closely at the definition of commercially marketed mm-hmm. versus something that's test marketed. Right. And I've been told off the record from a lot of cigar companies that, hey, they're looking to do SE against some very limited stuff, stuff mm-hmm. that was house cigars, that was predicate, um, stuff that was limited release. And I kind of started reading this definition and – the definition of the definition of commercially marketed is murky to say the least. Right. They don't have a solid definition there, yeah. and I think it's going to come down to how the FDA decides to 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 judge what is commercially marketed. Right. Um. the The interesting thing is, I think the cigar industry. I think there's some people that are ready for this, and I think there's some people that are going to get a rude awakening. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, because and I was I this is what I was saying. I kind of put out this little thing, and of course, I got some feedback from Skip, <laughs> right? But but I understood what he was saying too. Then he went off on a tangent. But the the idea is, I said, hey, you still think it's a bad idea to have a press release, right? Mm-hmm. I again, I think if you had a press release for something now, stuff from 2007 before, and it's going to be hard to have a press release. I, I, right. I get that. But if, what if they move that date to 2016? Right. Um, which could, that's something that could realistically happen, right? It's not, Mm -hmm. it's a long shot. I mean, how many of these companies, if you don't have a press release, um, I just, my opinion, if you're doing a press release, it shows you're serious about this. Right. Um, Yeah. I mean, it definitely gives you more, definitely gives you more ammunition mm -hmm. when, you know, if the things become defined a bit more and they say, Hey, you know, you had to have some sort of marketing material and defining what that is. I mean, I don't know that of, of, picture on Instagram defi- is def- going to be defined as, you know, commercial marketing kind of thing. Um, but, we, you know, like you said, it's murky, so we don't uh, no, know I which did, way it now, goes. I did talk to some people at some bigger companies this week, right? And they kind of feel the Instagram thing is valid. Okay. However, to to that point, um, to that point, there is, um, I, I mentioned, what if Instagram pulls your stuff down tomorrow? Right, like pulls down cigar stuff tomorrow. Yeah, they don't do any more cigar stuff. It's Guess just what? they're not your stuff yeah. is not there anymore. Yeah. So again, my my feeling is like, and I get asked from a lot of small companies, "Hey, do I need to do a press release?" On it? And my answer is always do the press release. Yeah, it always can't do. hurt. It can't hurt, right? So whatever you're doing on Instagram, just just put it there. And guess what? You have documentation that okay. 
I was serious about reaching my my channels, uh, my consumers, my retailers, my media partners. Right. It's all there. I, I just think, why wouldn't you want to protect your asset and then just protect yourself in general? Yeah. I mean, unless the unless the goal is to kind of stay a little under the radar, you know, to try to stop any kind of like any issues popping up right now, I can see that piece. But, you know, I, I would err on the side of caution in regards to that. Here's where here's where I kind of looked at. And I and if I was in an FDA chair, right, not being the bad guy here, but if I was asked to judge if something was commercially marketed or not, right. And there's that case where the product just shows up at your at your store. Okay, you got an invoice for it, but it just showed up, and mm -hmm. you have no marketing behind it whatsoever, other than that invoice showing up. Right. In my opinion, that's test marketed. Yeah. That is not commercially marketed. Right. Um, if you're able to show you're doing some advertising, some social media stuff, and some other things around that, right? I think that's going to strengthen your case. But I think if you know this model of Oh, we just had this limited release show. Up. I think it's, um, you know, I think it's 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 vulnerable. You know, like we we pick on Ezra Zion a lot, right? Yeah. But let's say Ezra Zion, I don't think their stuff would be you see stuff against them, right? But let's yeah. suppose you did, right? I actually think they do come. You may not like their marketing, you may not like their gimmicks, right. but I actually think they're marketing the stuff. Absolutely. Like, like, okay, we only made this much of it, but it's not a test. We're putting this as a, it's on our website. It's in our mailing email, list. Yep. Mailing list. It's on, on different uh, social media channels. I would say that's something that would totally qualify, you know, but again, I don't think that would be, I don't think there's SE stuff from 2007 like that. Right. Uh, I think there's a lot of these unbanded cigars that went out there. So I, I just think there's there's some some real questions that, that need to be answered with this right now. And I, I would be up, you know, if you're if you're doing your SC stuff, I'd be a little up at night what you're SCing against right now. You better hope exactly that, that's valid right now. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people want to say, all right, we're just using, you know, dark tobacco, air cured, all, you know, all this stuff. Um, and then they think that that's going to be enough. Yeah. That yeah. may be enough. Who knows? I right. mean, there's there's really no guidelines to go by. Like this is a completely skip, hi skip hypothetical that thing. Up. Skip yeah. that point up. Very, and he's right. He's 100 yeah. right on it. It's all hypothetical right now. You know, everybody's saying like everybody's trying to use logic against a government entity that can make the rules up as they decide to go. You know, that's what my point is: is that they can make up these rules and and. You know, I just again, I thought of that scenario where you, you used Instagram and Instagram says tomorrow we're taking out every cigar picture and, and right. all your text. What do you do? Yeah, I mean, you see how like creative like Hawaii is getting where they're like, you want, you want to make the age to buy tobacco like 99 years old. Like they can. Because they can't <laughs> they, ban it. They can't yeah, ban it. Right. They can get as creative as they want. Like it's not, you can't necessarily use logic as the way that you're going to be able to define whether it's allowed or not allowed. So. And guess what? If you go to the courts, right? Mm -hmm. That's no, like all the courts will do. <laughs> the courts will be, have we seen, I think, I think the cigar industry got a, got a, a awakening on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's interesting is, you know, in the conversations I have with Glenn Loop and the shows we did with him and stuff, Glenn kind of, I think, was always under that, you know, that impression too. That don't count on the courts. Exactly. <laughs> Favoring it either. So, you know, it, you have to kind of, uh, you know, he gets beat up on a lot of things. But I think one thing he's right about is, is kind of hitting this on different areas right now. Yep. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. So. Anything else on that? I don't think so. All right. So, uh, before we kind of wrap up, um. Next week, uh, Kyle Gellis of Warp Cigars, yes, um, will be our guest. Uh, that's our two year show. It's a two year anniversary. It's technically the uh, the 13th. He'll be on the 11th. So Kyle will be making his Warp Cigars debut. That's gonna be a pretty good show. Glad he were able yep. to get him. Absolutely, yep. it'll be a great show. Yep. And the week after, we just got the confirmation on Pedro. Nice. So, so Pedro Gomez of Drew Estate will be on the week after. Perfect. And uh, yep. so. Uh, so I think we are set for the next few, and then we'll have some more shows to announce over the next few weeks. Yep. Uh, anyway, uh, any contest stuff you have going on? Nope, not this week. Okay, the Alec Browley contest is still running on Cigar Coop. Uh, you, again, it's it's pinned to the top of the page. 
Just go there. Um, I like Bradley Price Pack. It includes the the ashtray, the humidor, the, the barrel humidor, the tumbler, and the lighter. Yep. Um, and all you got to do is leave a comment on your last Alec Bradley cigar. Um, easy to enter. I, yep. yeah. And if you submitted a selfie for the first contest, it carries over, but you can't submit any more selfies. Yep. And you get three, you get you still get your three entries with that. Nice. All right. Anyway, uh, great show. Um, that's going to wrap up the 90th show of primetime into the annals of history for this April 4th, 2019, now April 5th, 2019 on the East Coast. We'll see everybody next week. Have a great night, everybody. See you guys.